Good morning. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Helsner uh, from Downstate School of Public Health, and I'm also the chair of our Committee on Plant-Based Health and Nutrition, and I'm going to be your host for today's event. I am super excited that you're here. We have got a lot of great things in store for you today. Thank you so much for joining us to address one of the most pressing health issues that we're facing in New York City, in the United States, and even worldwide right now, which is the diabetes crisis, uh, particularly type 2 diabetes. If you're here in this room, you probably know a lot of people with diabetes. Um, they could be your patients, they could be members of your community, they could be members of your faith community, they, they could be members of your family, maybe even you have diabetes in this room. It is just so incredibly common. The prevalence of diabetes in New York City has more than doubled uh, in the past decade. And there are more than half a million people in New York City with diabetes and many, many more who have it and have not yet been diagnosed. So the problem is really um, immense. Um, we all know that, the, that diabetes itself brings risk. It can lead to cardiovascular disease, stroke, kidney disease, nerve damage, vision impairment, hearing impairment, and even cognitive decline. We don't want any of that. We don't want that for our patients, we don't want that for ourselves, we don't want that for the people that we care about. But the reason that we're here today is an incredibly positive one. We know that making lifestyle changes when it comes to diet, exercise, restorative sleep, stress management can lead to amazingly positive changes in glucose control and overall health. This conference was developed by Downstate's Committee on Plant-Based Health and Nutrition. So we really do believe in the power of whole plant foods for health. So of course, this is an important part of today's conference and we will be talking about that. Um, but there are other important areas of behavior change. Stress management is one of the big ones. It's hard to make big changes in your diet and in your exercise patterns if you're stressed out, if you're, if you're dealing with multiple social determinants of health like you know, having to juggle multiple jobs, having caregiving responsibilities, all of those things. So we need to talk about that today too. How can we really help people make behavior change? And that's something that we are definitely going to be touching on today. This morning you're going to learn about some suggested changes to the clinical treatment of diabetes that have been suggested by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, often clinicians address diabetes with a medication-focused approach, but it's critically important to support people in making these foundational changes in diet, physical activity, and stress management, and restorative sleep. So you, we're going to be hearing a lot about that this morning. I think you're in for a real treat today. We have a lot of really fun things in store for you. Um, we have invited an amazing group of people from all over New York City who are working in the diabetes space, and you're going to have a chance to meet all of them in our networking session that we're going to be doing after lunch. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I guess I'm, I'd like to say that I hope that all of us here together as a team can have a great conversation today. We all have so much to learn from each other, learn from the organizations who are working in this space, learn how to really help our patients and our loved ones deal with this, with this issue of type 2 diabetes. And I am so thrilled that you're here today. And uh, I am just excited for you, for all the great people that you're going to hear speak today. So now I'd like to introduce you to the dean of our School of Public Health, Dr. Kita Demisi, who would like to give an official welcome from downstate to you today. Dr. Demisi. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Helsner, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's conference on the lifestyle medicine approach to diabetes prevention and management. Diabetes, as you know, is one of the greatest challenges, public health challenges in New York City and beyond and strategies in addressing this issue is urgently needed. Uh, today, in this conference throughout the day, you will hear a lot of exciting good news about how to help communities, 
families and individuals who suffer from this disease and to help them how to manage and avoid or prevent the occurrence of the disease from the very beginning and also once they have it, how to manage it. The mission of SUNY Down State is uh, to provide outstanding health education pr uh, program and also translating uh, cutting edge research in this area and other areas into practice and caring for the patients in the community that we serve. And today's conference is nicely fitting to our mission uh, in this way. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the planning, the conference planning program committee who worked so hard to make this uh, happen. This includes faculty from our School of Public Health, uh, the College of Medicine, the School of Health Related Professions, the Department of Com uh, Continuous Medical Education, the New York City Mayor's Office, and our community partners, in particular, the Plant Powered Metro New York and the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for being here, uh, devoting your time, your commitment to learning more about how to help and support the health of people with diabetes is outstanding. And I wish you an excellent day of learning and collaboration and networking. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dean Demacy. And now I am honored to introduce you to one of the most important people in, lifestyle, in the lifestyle medicine community here in New York City, Dr. Michelle McMacken. Uh, Dr. McMacken is the Executive Director of Nutrition and Lifestyle Medicine at New York City Health and Hospitals, which is, as you know, the largest public health care system in the United States. A practicing internist at New York City Health and Hospitals Bellevue, she also directed Bellevue's Adult Weight Management Program. And in 2019, she founded the innovative Bellevue Lifestyle Medicine Program, which was the first of its kind in a safety net hospital. She now leads the expansion of this program to six new sites across New York City. Dr. McMacken is also an Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and she is an award-winning teacher. Welcome back to Downstate, Dr. McMacken. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Helsner, for that warm introduction. And I have to say, some of us were uh, joking um, while eating breakfast that this is the first time I have had perfectly ripe papaya for <laughs> breakfast at a conference. It was so delicious. So, I mean, this is just amazing. So kudos to you and the whole team, planning team. Yes, all right, so it's really my honor to have, uh, to have the opportunity to um, share some remarks this morning. Um, diabetes is something that I'm extremely passionate about, and I want to tell you a little bit about how I got here. Uh, so I am a physician, and as a physician in my training, I know it's cliche to say this at this point, but I genuinely got almost no nutrition education. I got almost no lifestyle education. And that continued through my residency training in internal medicine, and it continued through the first nine years of my practice as an attending physician. It was one fateful day in the summer of 2013 where I had a little bit of extra continuing education money, and I thought, how am I going to spend this money? At that time, I had been a primary care doctor for almost a decade, and I was honestly starting to get a little burned out. Because what I was doing over and over with every patient was literally countless prescriptions, of course, billions of forms, um, and I, I just didn't feel like I was helping my patients actually get better. And it was, it was a frustrating feeling, and, and I thought, I have to do something to change this. Um, now, that might sound selfless, but actually, I, it was almost more selfish because what I wanted to look for was a lifestyle conference for myself. And so I Googled lifestyle in medicine, 
like for, for me to have a better lifestyle because I was burnt out. And the first hit that came up was the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and their annual conference, which was being held that year in Washington, D.C. in the fall. And I thought, lifestyle medicine, what is that? I don't know what that is, but I have this money and I need a better lifestyle. It can't hurt, let me go. What I learned there at that conference was nothing short of transformative for my entire career and probably for some of my patients as well. Because what I saw was actually there's a tremendous amount of science behind our eating patterns and how that influences our health. I know this is not, this is not shocking to people who did not go to medical school. But for those of us who did, <laughs> it's shocking. Wow, there's so much science showing the benefits of how we eat. There's science around the benefits of sleep. There's science around the benefits of exercise. And, and to see that science was incredible. And I thought, how long, how many missed opportunities have I had where I haven't been employing this in my practice? And also, how do I employ this in my practice? I remember going back to work that first um, Monday morning after the conference and thinking, well, I'm, I'm so inspired right now. I have all this information in my head about what I want to do, but I don't really know how to make it happen with my patients. And my nine o'clock patient that Monday morning was um, a woman in her late 50s who had immigrated to the United States from Ghana a few years before. Um, and she had a history of coronary artery disease. She'd had a heart attack in the past. She had hypertension. She had high cholesterol. She had type 2 diabetes. And I realized right in that moment, I have never asked you, what do you like to eat? I've never asked you, how do you, get, how do you move your body during the day? How do you sleep? And so I said, let me just start by asking those questions. And what unfolded from that day was an unbelievably um, amazing enhancement to my relationship with my patients. She opened up and we talked about, you know, what are the cultural foods that she grew up eating and that she still enjoys? Um, she talked to me about her sleep. She talked to me about all of these aspects of her life that I had no idea, and it brought us closer. And I thought, well, let me just keep doing this. I know it takes, you know, I have to figure out how to do this efficiently, but it, this is really fun. And so over the years, I, I got better and better at it and, and more efficient and was able to actually work with patients in a way that helped them actually change and, you know, really listening to what they were ready to work on and supporting them in what their goals were. Um, and so along came about a couple of years after that, what I call the first sentinel event in my career. And that was a patient who I who I'm, uh, was taking care of who was 42 years old. He'd been living with type 2 diabetes for about eight years at that time. His hemoglobin A1C was 12.7 um, on this particular visit. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with that number, that's an average of your blood sugar over the previous three months. And a normal that, a number that is in the you know, normal range would be less than 5.7. So his was 12.7, very, very high blood sugar. And he had seen other uh, physicians in our practice and everybody just kept writing, refusing insulin, refusing insulin, refusing insulin. And I said, I talked to him and I said, well, what, what are you interested in working on? And, and did you know that actually, I know you're not, you're not big on medications, would you be interested in making some changes to the way you eat and exercise? And he was like, sure, definitely, Let me. what can I do? So we talked about moving towards a healthy plant-based eating pattern. We talked about exercise. He actually loved to bike, and he had a bike. Um, and I did successfully start him on metformin, which was great. Um, he was like, I'll take one pill if you allow me to work, not start on insulin and work on these lifestyle changes. I said, great. So he came back to me four months later with an A1C of 6.9. And I'll tell you, I didn't recommend this, but he actually threw his metformin out the window two months into that. And the look on his face when I told him, you have reduced your hemoglobin A1C by six points in four months, and how empowered he felt, and how empowered I felt. I, I actually feel chills just thinking about it now, remembering that day. And from that day forward, I thought, I can never not offer this to a patient. It's not that every patient is going to be ready to make changes, but every patient deserves the chance to have the support and to talk about it and to see what they are ready to do. So there was no turning back. And then a couple years after that, I had sentinel event number two. 
Central event number two was um, the, the case of a 54-year-old woman who had a new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And so that day in my office, I told her, you know, her, her, hem her hemoglobin A1C was 15.2. Really extremely high. Amazingly, she actually didn't have a lot of symptoms, and she also was very motivated to change her lifestyle. And I thought, this is great. Let's, let's talk about what we can do. So again, I talked about a healthy plant-based eating pattern. She had immigrated um, to the United States from Mexico a few years back, and I said, what are the foods that you already like to eat? And which are the ones that are health, you know, based in healthy plant foods, and how can we start emphasizing those more? And we talked about it. We, you know, I gave her a lot of support over the next few months. Also started metformin. Um, and in f six months, she came back with an A1C of 5.8 from 15.2. Then she said, and we celebrated, and I thought, this really is amazing. And she said, now can I stop the metformin? I was like, um... I don't know, you know, I mean, she had made a lot of lifestyle changes, and I thought, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but you know what, you're, you've demonstrated you're extremely motivated, you keep your follow-up appointments, we stay connected, let's just, let's see what happens. We stopped the metformin that day. 16 months later, her A1C was 5.6. She put her diabetes in remission. At that time, the definition of remission was a little bit uh, less lenient than it is now, which is three months. I mean, this is a long-term lifestyle change that she sustained and kept her diabetes in remission. And in that situation, what I learned is now, not only, am I, not only is it unethical for me not to bring this up, when I have a patient with a new diagnosis of diabetes where there's a lot of potential to put the diabetes in remission, it's unethical for me not to offer that as an option. So I think that you know, the, the science and the recommendations um, are starting to grow around recognition of remission. We're going to talk about that today, and that's really important. Um, and something that Dr. Helsner said is also really important, which is that although I will admit I'm extremely partial to nutrition, those of you who know me know I love talking about nutrition, but we do need to think about and act on all of the lifestyle pillars. Just like Dr. Helsner said, sometimes, as much as I want to talk about nutrition, the patient's sleeping only two hours a night. How are you going to, how are you going to be able to make healthier eating choices when you're so sleep deprived? How are you going to be able to exercise and have the energy when you're sleep deprived? So we want to work with where the patient's starting. Um, the other thing is the, um, the other thing I've learned is the importance of working with a team. Now, I'm extremely fortunate um, to have had the opportunity to launch a lifestyle medicine program, um, the pilot program that was launched at Bellevue. Um, there's one extremely brave individual here with me who helped start it, Chris Ann Paulito Muller. It really started as a group of de really, really dedicated physicians who were interested in this approach. Uh, registered dietitian Lily Correa and our health coach Chris Ann Paulito Muller. And we were very brave and we started a lifestyle program. We saw really wonderful results in our patients. And in 2022, as Dr. Helsner said, we had the opportunity to expand that program. And that expansion included not just moving out to six new sites across health and hospitals, but also expanding the team itself. And so that meant that we were able to hire more di registered dietitians, more health coaches, more physicians. We started to be able to include nurse practitioners in our program, community health workers, psychologists, program coordinators, and a fitness instructor. And I feel so lucky to be in the position to be able to bring together a team like this to help patients. I want to take a moment to acknowledge those of you, my colleagues who are in this room from Health and Hospitals, would you be willing to stand up? And I would like to applaud you for being part of this program. Don't be shy. <laughs> So we have a program in every borough. In some boroughs, we have two programs, including right across the street um, at King's. We have a wonderful program, and we have folks here from um, the Vanderbilt, Gotham Vanderbilt Lifestyle Medicine Program in Staten Island, and of course, Chris Ann and I from the Bellevue Program. So um, with that, I just want to say, even if you don't have an all-star team like I have right now, um, you can do this in your practice by yourself 
to, there's so much you can do, even if you don't have an all-star team. It's wonderful to just start asking the questions like I did. Find resources in the community. There's so many, and I know at this conference there's going to be a lot of interaction and, and um and review of the different resources that are available. And most importantly, as a, as a practitioner, just making your patient aware of what's possible and validating that this is, a, this is a wonderful approach is so important, that your word goes such a long way. So I'm gonna leave you with a quote from one of our patients uh, who recently graduated from our program. He said, I'm the healthiest I've ever been. I've lost weight and gained muscle. My cardio has improved tremendously. My sciatica pain and my stress levels have reduced. My blood pressure, cholesterol, and triglyceride levels have all improved. I sleep better, and I wake up feeling more energized. My only regret is not doing this sooner. Thank you so much. Okay. And for our next act, I would like to introduce our very own Dr. Rich Rosenfeld. Um, Dr. Rosenfeld is a distinguished professor and past chairman of otolaryngology here at Downstate. Rich has been an incredible advocate for plant-based nutrition here and lifestyle medicine at Downstate. He founded the Committee for Plant-Based Nutrition here, we were, we were thinking five or six years ago now. Um, and he is the faculty advisor for multiple student groups who are working in this space, including our Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group, the Downstate Initiative for Nutritional Empowerment, and also the Running Club, uh, because by the way, Rich is also a marathoner. Um, Rich follows a whole food plant-based diet. As I mentioned, um, runs marathons. He enjoys regular weight training. And in addition to all of this, he has published over 350 articles and chapters, given over a thousand scientific presentations, and was the editor-in-chief of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Journal for eight years. He has more than 30 years of experience in leadership, evidence-based medicine, and health policy including innovative national and international work in creating clinical practice guidelines, which is what we're going to be hearing about next. Um, he has been working with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine on their um, new, new, new guidelines for type 2 diabetes. And with that, I would like to invite Rich to come up and tell us more about this. Wow. Welcome, everybody. Let's do the good morning thing. Good morning. That's good. You're still alert and oriented. <laughs> and if you get bored of the ripe papaya, you can look at the orchids up front, <laughs> the, the moth orchids, which are always uh, fun. Uh, no one really introduced Beth much, but uh, Beth Helsner is a force to be reckoned with, as you can tell by the organization of this conference. Uh, she's the interim chair of epidemiology and biostatistics in the public health school, also works with geriatric medicine. And, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to have her involved from the start with our committee on plant-based health and nutrition. So now she can do all the work and I can just kind of tag along. So it's, uh, it, it, it's very nice. And uh, so, the ENT guy today is going to be talking to you about lifestyle medicine. So, you know, just keep that. Worse than that, I'm a pediatric ENT guy. Oh, my gosh, you know. But anyway, we'll, we'll see. So uh, this talk is going to take you through a little journey at American College of Lifestyle Medicine, uh, sort of the evolution of some diabetes-related um, work there. Let's see the advances that. So we've heard a little diabetes is a big deal, but you know, Lancet says it's an epidemic in the defining disease of the 21st century. A lot of people with diabetes and in Brooklyn we have the so-called Brooklyn diabetes or diabesity is very popular here. A lot of diabetes. Uh, eighth leading cause of death. It's way up there. And if you add in pre-diabetes, it's literally over half the population. So, um, you know, 14, 15% have it, another 30 some odd percent, 37% are on their way. And I'm sure that some of you in the audience might be in that category or 
maybe know some people. Uh, it's gone up a lot. It's tripled in the past 30 years. It is a big deal. And guess what? It's those lovely lifestyle habits or lack thereof that are driving the epidemic. Um, it, it's a big, big deal. You know, if you look at lifestyle, very few people have good lifestyles. Uh, you know, healthy eating is maybe 20% in the U.S. 70, 80% of what people eat is ultra-processed food that you need a chemistry degree to figure out what's in it. You know, physical activity, maybe 60% of people get some physical activity reasonable. You add in sleep, stress, and social relationships, and it goes way down. So the American Academy of Lifestyle Medicine, which was founded in, I believe, 2003 or four, 2004, it's 20 years this year, so I would say come join us in Orlando, but it's all sold out, so too bad. Um, it's not sold out. The in-person, I thought, was, but no. Hurry up. It's like, it's like if any of you are marathon runners or racers, you know, like if you don't, like the day it opens, if you don't sign up, it's gone, and then you got to get on some lottery or come up with obscene amounts of money for fundraising to get in, you know, so you can still register, so you should do it. Big event. So they've been around a little 20 years and started fairly modest, and then uh, Susan Benegas, who's the EVP CEO now, came in and injected some steroids into the group about 10 years ago. So now ACLM has about 10,000 members uh, and is growing fast. So they decided years ago to do a position statement on type 2 diabetes and decided that really the goal here should be remission, as was mentioned, meaning getting you off all your meds, typically for six months or longer, with a normal hemoglobin A1C. They looked at a bunch of high intensity studies, you know, studies where you went on like a 600 calorie liquid diet for a while, and then some subtherapeutic, and found that, yes, using just a whole food plant-based diet, especially if you get really intense to start out with, a lot of times you can get in remission. So this was a position statement. And Position statements are like preaching to the choir, you know? If you believe it at the start, you believe the position statement. But to just do a position statement and expect everybody to say, wow, we're gonna do this, it just doesn't work because it's sort of biased. It's the, it's the position of the organization and the people who wrote the paper. So if you wanna be trustworthy, you gotta get up to the next level. Um, and what we did then was called an expert consensus statement published about two years ago, and I was chairing that. And this is where you bring in some Delphi methodology, some rhyme and reason, and you have a plan, a protocol, and, and you get a little more serious about, about how you do it. And it was endorsed by a few of the relevant societies. This wasn't just lifestyle medicine. We had endocrinology and, and nutrition and every other related field involved. Um, as you can see, fairly diverse group that was into this uh, uh, statement here. So family physicians, clinical endocrinology, cardiology, the Heart Association. So you get all these people in a room and you try and get them to agree on something, which is a lot of fun for any of you who have tried to do this. Um, and it, it boiled down to this. You know, what should be the role? And again, this consensus product was focused on diet, nutrition. The guideline we're gonna to get to is more about all the lifestyle pillars. So, you know, is diet the best actor? Is, is it really the focus or is it a supporting actor? If you read every guideline out there, whether it's from ADA or any group, they're all about drugs and medicine and yeah, oh, by the way, you should eat right and eat healthy and you know, eat more plant foods and get some exercise and do this and do that, but they don't typically start by saying, Diet should be the first thing you do, and you can reverse your diabetes and get in remission just with diet. You know, it, it's the supporting actor, not, not the best actor, un, unfortunately. And with prediabetes, you, you know, no, no surprise, you go back over 20 years to the diabetes prevention, um, you, you know, projects uh, now with the CDC and others, but the first trials on that showed that uh, in well over 50%, I think it was close to 60%, you could prevent pre-diabetes from becoming diabetes just with a little healthy eating and some exercise. 
And guess what? Drugs, metformin, was only about 28 or 30%. So diet and activity were twice as effective as drugs. Yet here we are 20, 30 years later, and what are we doing? Drugs. GLP-1, right? Go buy some stock. And did you know that even Weight Watchers now has invested in a GLP-1 company? They used to blame being overweight and heavy on the patient. Yeah, you just don't have self-control. Now it's, oh no, it's not you. It's all in your brain and you had no control over it, but take these drugs and you'll be good. You know, just never stop the drugs or you're in trouble. So what did that consensus statement show? And I'm just gonna go through this fairly quickly. Uh, we talked about remission at the start. What does it mean to be in remission? And at the same time, the ADA, American Diabetic Association, had updated their definition of remission, uh, which is pretty much the, the one uh, on the bottom there. The, the hemoglobin A1C, less than 6.5. Remember, 5.7 is normal. We heard about some 12s and 15s, which are way in the stratosphere, with no surgery devices or pharmacologic therapy. So uh, that's what we're looking to achieve. It's the optimal outcome. It is realistic and achievable for some, you know, many adults, and it may be dependent on duration. If you've had type 2 diabetes for 10 years, it's a little more difficult to achieve remission than if it's been a couple of years. Diet is the cornerstone. It's not the supporting actor. It's the cornerstone. And if you're doing drugs, you really need to be having dietary uh, therapy as well. It's related to intensity. So if you just say, all right, I'm going to eat an extra cup of legumes every week, that's probably not enough to change the scales. Um, but if you get serious with whole food plant-based, you're you know, eating a diet with whole grains, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, um, uh, lots of legumes in there for your protein, you're going to do pretty well. And to really kickstart it, a lot of the studies went on these very low calorie diets, you know, often liquid diets for a week or two or three, and then transition to a healthier plant-based sustainable type of, of eating. Unrefined carbohydrates. And we'll get into this more in the panel, but there's this misperception that, boy, I'm diabetic, I got to watch my carbs. It's nonsense. You just got to watch your refined carbs. Actually, don't watch them. Don't eat them is even better. <laughs> you know, just, just ignore them. But you can eat all sorts of whole grains, and, and it's fine. And I can't tell you how many people I meet who are diabetics and, oh, no, 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 I, I can't eat the carbs. And I try and tell them the whole grains are all going, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's almost like a, a phobia we've created. Uh, whole food plant-based diet, I think you know what that is. We tend to use the words uh, plant predominant eating pattern now, right? Because uh, diet sounds like you're trying to lose weight and plant-based sounds like, you know, something a zebra would do. Um, so uh, it's, a whole, it's a whole food plant predominant eating pattern. And if you've never done it before, you're going to do it today, like it or not, for breakfast and lunch. So. Um, you're stuck with it. Plant forward, plant predominant diets are shown here uh, with various versions. The dash is for hypertension. Uh, I personally, you know, and I think a lot of people in the field would consider the whole food plant-based, uh, plant predominant to be the best, which tends to have a lot of carbs once you factor in all the legumes and whole grains. So it's a very carb intense diet, um, but it's, uh, it's fine. As an athlete, Liz mentioned I, I run marathons. I never ran until I was age 56. First marathon, age 60. I'll be 66 soon, and I just did marathon 10 in London two weeks ago. Um, so you can start late and do this, but I need a lot of protein doing that. And so I got to go above that 15% protein. I'm probably more in the 20, 25% uh, protein when no one was looking this morning. I added peanut powder to the uh, overnight oats because it gave me an extra 10 grams of protein. Uh, this, this type of diet, healthy eating pattern, can sustain remission. So however you get there, you can likely sustain it. Um, and it's, it's you know, something you can do for a long time. It'll, it's also going to help with cardiovascular risk independently. So a lot of benefits. 
there are alternatives. There's these low carb, you know, ultra low carb, you know, um, keto type diets, which get a lot of attention, you know, particularly paleo. The actual paleo diet, if you, you look at the real version of it from, you know, antiquity, it was, um, it was healthy because it, it wasn't eating tons of meat and cheese and things. It was mostly plant-based. You just didn't, you didn't eat the grains and you had some meat and other things there. The new paleo is, you know, all about, you know, eating tons of butter and meat and, you know, everything uh, animal related. Similarly with keto, you know, keto of course came about as a way to control um, epilepsy in kids. You know, it was, that, that's why keto diet came about and it worked reasonably well. The problem was no one could tolerate it because you just get the worst GI symptoms, loose stools, upset stomach, all sorts of other effects. So. It may be a way to lose some weight, but it's not a very sustainable eating pattern for, for most things, and we don't recommend it. Um, we had so much fun with our first consensus statement um, in lifestyle medicine that we said, let's do it again. So now we decided to say, how can we integrate this into primary care? So um, this one, Megan Grega had chaired. I was down the line as a methodologist. And this was, again, a fascinating, you know, discussion we had. I'm not going to get into the details of this, but the conclusion of this very diverse group was that, yes, it is very feasible and should, we really should integrate lifestyle medicine into primary care. It's not being done. It should probably be part of all graduate medical education, but certainly there are ways to do it. And we get into some of the pragmatic things with the group visits, the shared medical appointments, uh, you know, and so forth. So now, what are we doing? A guideline. Anybody here participate in the guideline panel? I know there are at least two because they're on our current, a few raised their hand. Oh, it's so much fun getting like all these people from different walks of life to sit in the room and agree on something, right? So anybody know the Tuckman and Oldman stages of group development? You learn this in when you get a business degree. So Tuckman and Oldman many years ago said, when you put a group together and it's very diverse and you want to do something, there are stages they go through. Number one, forming. Number two, storming. Number three, norming. Number four, performing. So it's that storming stage that's so much fun. When you put them all in a room and they all got their agendas, they're all thinking, I, I represent this group, I'm an endocrinologist, I'm gonna get this in there. And then sooner or later, you got to get them to subjugate their primary thoughts to the group benefit. Um, we're, we're, I don't know, six months into this guideline, nine months into this guideline. And of the 20 people, I think we've got about 18 on board with this concept of the group. There are still a few that are in that storming stage, which makes it so much fun. Um, and we actually have two of our folks here. Uh, I know Leanna's here from Plant Powered Metro New York. Uh, over there's Leanna. And uh, Lori Donnell is not there, but she's our CEO of our uh, faculty practice plan. Um, she's involved with this. We need consumers to keep this sane and rational, you know, basically. Otherwise, we go off the rails. And uh, um, it, it's an interesting project. So I'm going to share some of that with you. Does everybody need to be an expert? Or let me make it more personal. Should a pediatric END guy who's never treated a single adult with diabetes be chairing a guideline on type 2 diabetes? Hmm. Wow. Well, you can do it. It's all right. Um, and it's actually preferred because it's really less biased. My background is in guidelines and quality. I've been doing it for 30 years and done it a lot with other groups. You need the experts to keep you on track, to keep you focused and help you understand the evidence. But whoops, go back previous. But as Feynman says, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. So we get a lot of experts who probably shouldn't be called experts, but they are anyway. Um, and we need consumers, we need buy-in. So what is this here? This just shows you the guidelines we identified at the start that seem to have some lifestyle interventions. So there were eight of them, the last being the ADA. Um, there weren't a lot, and most of them tended to emphasize nutrition or maybe physical activity. 
Um, ADA is, uh, we'll talk about in a moment. That's this one here, the standards of care, which is a, a big document. Huh? It's like, you know, like four or 500 pages they come out every year. And this was their updates. And if you glance at it, there's nothing in here about lifestyle, nutrition, you know, physical activity. It was all about technology and interesting things, GLP-1 inhibitors. So not a big focus, uh, unfortunately. And it's, and it's not mentioned much. I don't think the word whole food, plant predominant, or plant-based comes up once in this uh, uh, guideline that I could find. Uh, there's a systematic review of guidelines that actually made nutritional recommendations. They tend to be fairly low quality guidelines. They talk about a few different eating patterns and focus on macronutrients, supplements, functional foods, et cetera. So um, they're interesting, but don't necessarily give very pragmatic advice for how to really do this right, which is what we're seeking in the guidelines. So I'll end with a, a few slides about the guideline. We'll get into detail on this in the panel. Uh, but we always have what's called a PICO statement, who's your population, intervention, comparison, and outcomes. And we're including in here prediabetes and gestational diabetes mellitus as well. We're excluding things that have to do with complications of diabetes, cystic fibrosis, post-transplantation, et cetera. Uh, we're focusing on the more pragmatic things. Our definitions are here, and for time purposes, I'm not going um, through them. But you can see here, uh, it's important to define things up front. We may all think we know what a lifestyle intervention is, or lifestyle medicine is, or whole food plant predominant is, but not necessarily, so we spell it out. And the key thing about this guideline, and this was alluded to before, is that we're focusing on the pillars, not just nutrition. So these are the pillars. And I saw a sign I had two minutes, but we started like 10 minutes late, so I don't know how I still have two minutes. It's interesting. Um, so I can't finish in two minutes. I'm sorry, you, we started 10 minutes late. <laughs> I'll talk fast, you know. But uh, I can talk fast, but it's not a recipe for linguistic purity if you're born in the Bronx and live in Brooklyn uh, and work in Brooklyn. So anyway, nutrition is the first pillar. And there's a ton of evidence behind that. Physical activity is the second one, and equally important is reducing sedentary time, as we'll do in a moment after this talk. Uh, stress management is a big deal. Sleep, you know, getting that six to eight hours a night and, you know, really refreshing and recharging your body. These positive relationships, social connectedness is a big deal, and avoiding the bad stuff, you know, too much alcohol, smoking. So these are the pillars. And in our, our guideline, we're dealing with each of these pillars, some in more detail than others, but that, that's what we talk about as far as pillars of lifestyle intervention. We define prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, and remission of diabetes. Uh, it just bears noting that 95% of all diabetes is type 2 which has been called in the past non-insulin dependent, adult onset. Uh, some of them require insulin, but many are managed with uh, just medication. Gestational diabetes is something that has a high possibility of progressing to future type 2 diabetes. That's during pregnancy. So what's the good news? Lifestyle interventions are more effective than medications. We've known this for, you know, ever with the uh, diabetes prevention uh, programs, but uh, these are the, the references there you don't have, but they're systematic reviews and things we identified in our guidelines. They can do a lot. Just lifestyle alone can improve your quality of life, reduce your cardiovascular risk, get you employed. I mean, all sorts of good stuff. And there's studies showing, irrespective of your background, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, this stuff works. The bad news is only about 20% of U.S. adults actually have a healthy lifestyle. Uh, diets, 25%. Healthy weight, 25%. I mean, this is pretty bad. I guess, you know, only 9% of us are drinking too much, but um, it's uh, not good. 
And the ADA standards of care, 300 pages, so it's a PDF, you can search it. It has nine mentions of lifestyle interventions in the 300 pages. Some of them may be in the references. Uh, one whole food, one ultra processed food, and no mentions of this stuff. So this to me seems to be a little omission. And that's where I think we're trying to fill the gap here. Um, we had a lot of evidence. We found 203 systematic reviews relevant to our guideline, 171 randomized trials. Many have to do with the first two pillars, physical activity and nutrition. You know, less often various niche areas, ketogenic diet or, um, you know, um, bariatric surgery, et cetera. But a lot of evidence out there. This just shows you a typical statement we might have in our guideline. So you need to advocate. Don't ignore this stuff. Tell patients up front that this is really important. And we do what are called evidence profiles, where we look at the evidence. What are the benefits? What's the downside? How certain can we be about telling people to do this? And um, you know, this will probably be published early in 2025, I would say. We've got a little ways to go. Um, I'm not going to show you the other pillars, because that will be in the, the panel. But we have a nice flow chart that starts by saying, you know, advocate for this. Assess where the patient is at this time and get to know their priorities. What are they seeking to achieve? What are they willing to do? What's their readiness to change? You know, where are they? Once you've done that, we get into SMART goals, which are the specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound goals. So I may tell you, eat broccoli. One cup. Steam it twice a week for the next six weeks. And then you can go back to eating all the garbage you normally eat. Um, so that's a smart goal for, for eating. And these are examples of vague versus smart goals. A lot of the guidelines give vague goals. Yes, eat more vegetables. Well, you know, that's kind of hard to do. Or, or don't, don't stress out, you know? All right, instead do these deep breathing exercises. You know, it's about being specific and consistent with the patient's values. This is the middle part of the guideline where we get into all the different pillars and stuff, which um, um, you won't be able to read. I'll, I'll see if we can make the PDF available if people want to you know, access this um, uh, afterwards. But th they correspond to the pillars. And then at the very end, we talk about sustaining behavior change, continuity of care, and, and, and de-prescribing. As was mentioned, once you get this under control, you can often cut your meds. So that's a, a good thing. So that, that, that's it. Um, as far as I can tell, I spoke for about 25 minutes. But uh, <laughs> the timekeepers might have a different, uh, different opinion. So I, I will leave it to our MC to decide if there's time for any questions or if we want to just move, move forward. A couple of questions. So you have to go to the mic if you want to ask a couple of questions. And I'm Sarah Leventer. I'm one of the family medicine chiefs, chief residents. Um, I wanted to um, ask if you could address, last time I was looking through some recommendations from the American Diabetes Association, I noticed that they do recommend eating lean meats. They specify chicken. They talk about yeah. cheese, and so I'm. I just it's kind of a broad question. Are these organizations, some of the organizations that we look to for our guidelines, going to get on board with this plant-based? Yeah. So good, good question. And if you look at things like the Dash diet, you know, for hypertension, there they do recommend some lean meats and and animal products in there and even the mediterranean diet has lots of fish and dairy and other things uh, olive oil so um yes we could debate whether that should be in there it's in the healthy plate you know the recommendations from the u.s government uh, um, red meat in particular is considered a probable carcinogen by World Health Organization. Processed meats are a definite carcinogen. We could discuss uh, dairy and, uh, um, and fish and chicken. But I, I think what's most important is not what you eat, but what you, uh, but what you don't eat. So if you want to have a little red meat and, and this and fish and dairy, as long as you have a lot of legumes, you have a lot of nuts, seeds, you're eating your whole grains, you're not getting too much salt, 
and you're getting a lot of fiber in your diet, the fruits and veggies, you're gonna do fine. What kills you is not eating the good stuff, and that's what makes your diabetes worse. The only exception is salt. Salt is like the worst in terms of all-cause mortality um, worldwide, but a little bit of judicious meats and chicken and dairy, fine. I don't eat it, but if people want to, that's fine with me. It's making sure you get the good stuff is, is what's important. Yes. Good morning. Just in response to the question that we had here, first of all, I'm Lucille Hughes. I'm the immediate past president of the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. I am a certified diabetes care and education specialist myself. Um, what we are seeing is a movement. Obviously, we are certified in lifestyle behavior change. This is what we this is what we do as diabetes care and education specialists. So this falls right into our wheelhouse. But what I'd love to see at our association, hopefully, we'll be branching into others. Is we now have a COI communities of interest on plant-based nutrition. So we're seeing this infiltration. We're seeing the implementation of this mentality. This focus, and it really, really makes me thrilled to see that. So the answer is yes, we're seeing this entering our associations on a greater scale, so thank you. Now all we have to do is get rid of the meat industry and the dairy industry and we'll be good, you know. Um, the Healthy Plate US, they have up on the upper right uh, milk and dairy as necessary for your calcium and bones. In Canada, they just have water because they don't have industry involved in their guidelines, so. It's changed. You've got to praise progress, as they say. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks so much, Rich. Now, I would like to invite to the stage our Director of Continuing Medical Education here at Downstate and also a long-standing member of our Committee on Plant-Based Health and Nutrition, Ms. Edelyn Mitten. Um, Edelyn is also a yoga instructor. And she will be leading us in a brief centering activity before we hear from our keynote presenter. So I know you guys didn't get here, uh, rushing to get here, so we're going to take a few minutes. So if you miss you doing your meditation this morning, you're going to come forward on your seat. You're going to put your palm resting on your thighs. Stand tall. You're going to cast your eyes down, or if you can close them, if that's more comfortable for you. And it will start to bring your focus to your awareness to the body. Notice how you're feeling. Bring the awareness to your breath. And you're going to take a deep breath into the nose. And then we're going to exhale out the mouth. Inhale in. Exhale out. Again, inhaling in. Exhaling out. One more time, inhaling to the nose and exhaling out. Now we're going to take another deep breath. This time we're going to exhale to the nose. So lips gently seal. Going to inhale to the nose and exhale to the nose. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale and just bring your focus back to your body notice any sensation any tangling any stress relax the shoulders and kind of feel this warm glow at the center of the heart expanding to the body giving you energy and positivity <coughs> while you're keeping your focus on the breath. And then start having gratitude for the day that you're here today in this space to take care of you. And then when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes, bring your focus and awareness back into the present moment. 
Good, so staying seated. You're gonna start to bring your shoulders up toward your ears and then roll them back toward the spine, bringing it down. So as you inhale, you bring the shoulders up toward the ears and send them back. Again, inhale up and send it back. Now we're going to bring it forward. We're going to inhale, shoulders up. Bring it forward and up and forward and up and forward. Good. Now we're going to bring the right ear toward the right shoulder. Chin down toward your chest. Left ear towards the left shoulder. Chin down towards the chest. Right ear to the right shoulder. Chin down. Left ears. And back to center. Now we're going to do some cat and cow. So you're going to, you can keep your hands on your palm or if you want, extend it forward. There's no, there's not much space. You're going to, Leading with the chest, you're going to inhale, bring your chest forward. And exhale, you're going to bring it back, rounding the back, rounding your shoulder. Inhale, forward. Exhale. Inhale, forward. And exhale, back. And one more. Inhale, bring it forward. And exhale, we get the back. Great. So now back to center. So from here, you're going to take both hands, put it on the right side of your thigh. You're going to lift the chest, and you're going to look over your left shoulder. Breathe. Again, back to center. You're going to lift both hands. You're going to do the other side, left, and look over your right shoulder. And back to center. Great. Now, if you can open the legs slightly and then move forward and then back. Good. Now, you're going to close the leg. I know there's not much space to work with, so I'm not going to tell you to bring your arms up. So bring your arm forward so you don't hit your neighbor. Bring it up. You're going to intertwine the fingers, interlace your fingers. Look up. And palms come together, bring it down. Good. We'll do it one more time. Forward, up, interlace the fingers. Good. Look up. Palms together, and bring it down. Good. Now you've got to bring your toes up, and then heels up, toes up, heels up. Again, toes and heel. Great. So now we're going to stand just a bit. So you're going to take your right arm, bring it to the back of your chair. Just hold it. And then bring your left arm, stretch it forward. Great. Feel that stretch. And come back to center. We do the other side. Hold it. Good. Come back to center. Do it again on the right side. And this time, say hi to the pastor at the back of you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and center. And then go to the other side. Say hello to the other person. Say hi. Good. Center. Good. So now we're going to shake the hands. Shake each leg. And you're going to shake it, shake it, shake it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I'm not saying. Have a word. Just have a, a statement from Dr. Katz. I'm from physical therapy here at Downstate, and I've taken a lot of coursework on osteoporosis, and I know that this is a diabetes conference. Uh, but I just wanted to make you all aware, if you have patients with osteopenia or osteoporosis, uh, or even for yourselves if you do, that, that what you want to avoid is doing trunk flexion, trunk lateral flexion, and rotation. Because one of the vulnerable areas in osteoporosis is our vertebral bodies, and we don't want them to fracture. So 
you can modify a couple of those exercises. The one where you went forward, flex from the hips and don't roll your upper spine forward, your thoracic spine, because that is the area that's most likely to fracture the vertebral bodies of the thoracic spine. So just flex forward from the hips and then you come back up. And you can also modify the one where we went sideways. Instead of rotating your trunk, just move your feet. <laughs> and then, you know, when you bring your arms up like that, you're, you're not rotating your trunk. So I just wanted to, just, just my two cents. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. Okay, so now I have the distinct honor of welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Beth Frades. Dr. Frades is a trained um, physiatrist and a health and wellness coach. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's received several teaching accolades from the Harvard Extension School and the Harvard Medical School, where she is an assistant clinical professor. Dr. Frades is one of the first fellows of the ACLM and a pioneer in lifestyle medicine. In 2008, Dr. Frades created the first lifestyle medicine interest group at Harvard Medical School, and we have one here at Downstate now, which is fantastic. Um, in 2014, she developed and taught a college lifestyle medicine curriculum at the Harvard Extension School, and it is still one of the most well-received courses offered at the school. Dr. Frades is the current president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, Dr. Frades literally wrote the book on lifestyle medicine. She authored a lifestyle medicine syllabus, which can be downloaded through the ACLM website to serve as a template for other instructors and professors. She also co-authored the Lifestyle Medicine Handbook, an introduction to the power of healthy habits. To accompany the syllabus and the handbook, she co-created Lifestyle Medicine 101, which is an entire course that is available um, with full slide sets and lesson plans um, to the public. So that is just a fantastic, fantastic addition. In addition, Dr. Frades co-authored the Teen Lifestyle Medicine Handbook, which was published in 2020. And when it's paired with the teen curriculum, which um, consists of a teacher's manual and 12 PowerPoint decks, it can be used to teach and empower middle school and high school students to adopt and sustain healthy habits. In September of 2023, Dr. Frades co-authored the Lifestyle Medicine Pocket Guide. Um, as director of the wellness programming at the Stroke Institute for Research and Recovery at Spalding Rehab Hospital, which is a Harvard Medical School affiliate, Dr. Frades has created and implemented a 12-step wellness program, which is called Paving the Path to Wellness for patients and providers. Most recently, she, she co-authored authored the book, Paving the Path to Wellness Workbook, a guide to thriving with a healthy uh, body, peaceful mind, and joyful heart. And as of the fall of 2020, Dr. Frades serves as the director of the College of Lifestyle Medicine and Wellness for the Department of Surgery at Mass General Hospital. In addition, Dr. Frades has her own lifestyle medicine consulting and coaching practice where she sees patients one-on-one -on -one and in groups. So I think it's pretty clear that we have an expert on our hands here. And I would like to invite Dr. Frades up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. And I am a New Yorker. So it, 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 I'm in Boston, yes, but I'm a New Yorker. And it really feels good to be back home. So thank you so much. I, I, I want to mention that when I arrived, I was in the crosswalk and Nadine, many of you met Nadine, she gave you your name tag. Nadine came straight up to me and said, welcome Dr. Frades and escorted me across the crosswalk and into the room and I said, this is New York hospitality. This is the way New Yorkers do it. That was probably planned, who knows. But anyway, I'm so delighted to be here today. It is a true honor to speak with you and spend the day with you. So. I know I have an hour, correct? Terrific. To share some of my passion in lifestyle medicine to build on what you've already heard today. 
do have some disclosures. I've been on the scientific advisory board of Jenny Craig Medical Advisory Board of Obvious Solutions at Clearing.com, and I have my own lifestyle medicine consulting practice. Today, with you, I want to focus on discussing these six pillars of lifestyle medicine that you've heard about already, how they relate to surgeons, physicians, and patients alike. So what do we all have in common in this room? Anybody? Name some things we all have in common. We care about health, I heard. We care about food, yes? The ability to make choices. We believe in the ability to make choices, autonomy. Mm -hmm. We are passionate about lifestyle change, yeah. And I'm thinking even simpler than all of your minds. We're all human beings and patients. Please tell me. Nobody, just look down. Does any, if you have a primary care physician of your own, please just raise your hand. Nobody look around the room, just raise your hand. If you have a primary, thank you. Uh, this is a real passion for me, especially recently, because I have a dear colleague who's a physician who, who did not get his PSA followed up on and now has prostate cancer. So I just, it's a real, uh, personal issue I have with physicians who are not following up with their own care, health care providers who do not follow up on their own care. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that majority of you do have a physician. Okay, so we're going to highlight the role of each of these pillars for health. That's physical health and mental health, both. How many are mental health specialists in the room? Yeah, terrific, great. So important for you to give us feedback and for you to bring this back to your communities. And then identify ways in which the pillars influence each other. It's really important. There are these six pillars, but they're not separate. They're not in silos. You saw this definition. Dr. Rosenfeld showed this to you. I'm going to go into a little more detail and share some things here. Lifestyle medicine is a medical specialty. How many of you knew that before coming to this conference? Okay, so a lot of you did, some of you did not. You can in fact be board certified in this specialty as of 2017. And in this specialty, we use therapeutic lifestyle interventions as primary modality to treat, to manage, to put into remission when we can, as you heard, and to prevent chronic conditions, including our number one killer, which has been our number one killer for decades, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and of course, a risk factor, a major risk factor for heart disease is diabetes. We talk about and call out type two diabetes in our definition and obesity. So when you're certified in lifestyle medicine and how many of you are, through the ABLM or ACLM, many of you, terrific. That means that you know the doses. You know that these pillars are like pills. So physicians who are lifestyle medicine board certified prescribe pills. Sure, you heard Dr. McMacken talking about metformin. Yes, you prescribe pills when indicated, but you also prescribe pillars. And there are doses, intensities, and frequencies to these pillars like there are for pills. And you learn that when you're board certified. I do have to say one of the biggest honors in my, in my career so far was being asked to be one of the four item writers for the initial examination in 2017. And that tells you I'm a massive nerd. I love getting into the science. And, and that's what we're going to do a little bit together today. And I hope that you enjoy it as well. So when you're certified, you're trained to apply evidence-based whole person. You've heard about whole health? Anybody in the VA system? Whole health. OK, no. So using the whole health model at the VA, they talk about mental health, social health, physical health, and the whole person, treating the whole person, not just their signs and symptoms of disease. We do that, a whole person prescriptive lifestyle change to treat and when used intensively, often reverse or put into remission these chronic conditions. You heard the six pillars, you're gonna hear them again today multiple times. Whole food, plant predominant eating pattern, that's what we use at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substance, and a focus in on enjoying positive social connections. 
Can you raise your hand if you enjoy positive social connections on a daily basis? Love this group. Okay. <laughs> and we are doing that together today, and that's why I'm delighted to be with you all day, so that I too can connect with you. Now, we have talked about patience. Dr. McMacken beautifully described two patients that influence her to this very day. I also have a patient that influences me. Do you have a patient that influences you day in, day out, and inspires you? I'm just curious. You may or may not. Does anyone, if you do, just raise your hand? I'm just curious. So, so some do. So I'd love to share the story of this patient. He has given me full rights to share everything about his story in hopes that it will inspire others. Would you like to hear the story? Yes. Oh, terrific, good, okay, good, because I want to tell the story pretty badly, okay. So I love being here in New York. I'm not often present in New York, so again, honored and delighted to be here. I am sharing with you a story of a New Yorker. This gentleman here, does anyone recognize him, by the way? If you recognize him, don't say, but uh, if you recognize him, maybe just raise your hand. Okay, so he has a familiar look and he has a very familiar story. I have, the medical students have asked me if that was Herb Benson. It is not. Herb Benson is the founder of the relaxation response at Harvard, so the Harvard medical students have that in their head. Other people ask me if it's Gerald Ford. That is me next to him, so that's awkward. <laughs> um, and those are the medical students asking me, so anyway. Um, and then I get a lot of other people that he looks like, and his story is very, very common. M maybe you all relate to it more than most. So, New York City businessman, he's 72 here, but I'm taking you to a time when he was 52. Doesn't look like any of you have reached that age yet, but think about being 52. New York City, overweight, overworked, businessman, overstressed who dined almost exclusively on fast foods. Ate fast, walk fast, talk fast. We're in New York. And at the corners of New York, you can find what? What do you find to eat? And the hot dogs, pretzels, this is what he would be consuming while he was walking and talking with clients, with colleagues, getting it done because he took over his father's business, and he was dedicated to his clients. How many feel in this room dedicated to their patients? And this was a dedication that was beyond this norm. This was extreme dedication such that he would go into the office at 6, return home around 11.30 at night, and spend a lot of the night not sleeping. So when we think of the pillars, you already heard nutrition was atrocious. Sleep was non-existent, hmm, an hour or two, and then he'd be up, go to the kitchen, go to the cabinetry, and get what? Yeah, he's not getting kale and quinoa. No, no, for those of you who shouted that out, that's no, that's not what he was getting. He was getting Oreo cookie, double stuff. He was getting uh, Cheez-Its. He was getting um, those orangey cheese noodles. What are those cheese? Cheetos, yep. He's getting Cheetos, potato chips, ice cream, and then he'd go back. Then he'd wake up, he'd make lists of what he had to do for the next day. He'd be up at 5, ready for the 6 a.m. train into the office. So sleep, non-existent, stress high, nutrition, challenged. Social connection, married with kids at the time, teenagers, loving wife and family. Connected to his clients, connected to work. When he was home, which was rare, obviously, he wasn't present. Do you know what I mean? He was home, but his head was at work. And everybody knew that, that was around him. And then I'm missing a major pillar. Which one? Yes, thank you. So for exercise with this gentleman at 52, it was non-existent. Now, he was an outstanding baseball player, soccer player, basketball player, very active growing up. But at 52, he was sedentary. Uh, but, but, but he did do one thing. No one has ever guessed it, but I'm in New York, and I'm thinking in this audience, someone's going to get this right. I just feel it, although no one has ever gotten it right before. Um, 
What did you say? He ran sketch the train. Do you know the story? <laughs> this is New York. I said to myself, this is the only group that's going to get it right. I can't even believe it. And I was going to offer a book, any book you wanted, to someone who got it right. And I'll still offer that. So you heard about several books. You can pick whatever book you want, and I'll get it to Rich, and he'll get it to you. But anyway, OK, so the story goes, but it's kind of ruined now. I was going <laughs> it's, no, 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 it's fantastic that you asked. Are you kidding? No, I'm so excited I, that, you, that you gave the right answer. So but the, what I was going to tell you was he didn't do any exercise routinely, which is true. He didn't. But I was going to tell you he did one thing. He did it at the exact same time of the day, but you never knew what day he would do it on. But you knew the time of day he would do it. And you knew that activity was going to be sprints, mad dashes from 101 Park Avenue, and you all understand this better than any audience I've ever talked to, so from 101 Park Avenue to Grand Central Station, which was what you immediately said. What's your name? Mahir, I can pick on Mahir all day now uh, because he got the right answer, which is what Mahir said. Now, on one of these sprints, this is at 11.07 PM. He timed it out because he knew how fast he could get out of the office and to the train station. That's this man. So he, at 11.07, on one of those days, sprinted, and what happened? Little pain, little pressure, no pain, no gain. Sure, he's strong. He made it to the train. His wife, teacher, no experience, none in medicine, looks at him. He's diaphoretic, short of breath, pale, and she takes him right to the local emergency room where he completes his massive myocardial infarction and subsequent Middle cerebral artery infarct on the right side, leaving him paralyzed on the left side. The day in the life of a New York City overworked, overweight, overstressed businessman. So good news. He went to PT, OT, worked for a full year. Anyone in physiatry here, physical medicine? We do have a PT right here, Dr. Katz. Just heard about it. Yes, wonderful information you share. Is that it? The two? Oh, three. Terrific. Okay. So thanks to people like you, he made a full recovery except for, as you know, fine motor movement in the left hand. But he went to Pritikin. This is in 1986. New York City, smart guy, does his research, says, this happened to me. It's not going to happen to me again. So he goes to Pritikin. Anyone know Pritikin centers? Pioneers in lifestyle medicine. Pioneers. So they were doing this in the 80s, helping people like this gentleman reverse their disease, reverse their lifestyle, and get into healthy patterns with eating, with exercise, with stress resiliency. So he got an exercise bike, was on that bike, reaching the guidelines. So that means he was accumulating how many minutes of physical activity? So half hour, five days a week, accumulating 150 moderate intensity exercise, minutes in the week. And he changed his diet to be half the plate fruits and vegetables, a quarter whole grain, quarter healthy protein, no red meat, as it was in 1987. And he became more loving, more connected with his family. He worked from 8 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon, started sleeping better, and lived his best 27 years of his life life after that stroke at 52. So that's my dad. And that happened to me, <laughs> happened to him, <laughs> at my age of 18 when he was 52. I was the next generation to take that business over, financial advising and accounting. I was already an economics major at, at Harvard at the time that this happened. I was a freshman. But that changed everything for him, for me. And here I stand before you, having watched that and then researched it basically since I was 18 and been on the journey for myself, of course. First, I wanted to prevent that from happening to dear old dad because I love the man. Now, he wasn't present and he had struggles, but I love that man. Even though he was living that very challenging life, of course, I loved him. 
So I didn't want it to happen again. I wrote a book about how to prevent a second stroke after going to Stanford Medical School, coming back, going to MGH, doing my internship, doing my physical medicine rehab training. And like Dr. McMacken said so well, I learned nothing about what I knew was the crux of medicine. So I wrote that book, and then a colleague of mine, Dr. Eddie Phillips at Harvard, said, you're doing lifestyle medicine. This was 2006. I said, I'm doing what? Lifestyle medicine. I, said, I don't know, but it sounds like what I'd want to do. So from that moment on, I have been sold on this field and working my tail off to help progress. So six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Can we do a little exercise together? Yeah. Are you up for it? Okay, then I invite you, and this is an invitation, no one has to do this, right? This is an invitation. I invite you to stand. I invite you to remove all shame, blame, and guilt from the room in your own head, and we are not judging anyone in this room, okay? There's no judging in this room. Now, we are gonna remain standing if we can answer yes to questions. If we can't answer yes, we are going to sit down. The people that remain standing, I, I'd be happy to get you books like I will be doing. But I do want to mention this. Some people just feel like sitting, so you can't judge anyone. Someone may just feel like sitting, to be honest. Somebody just may want to sit down, and you're free to sit when you like, OK? So we don't know what's really going on. But we know that you're only going to stand if you can answer yes to these questions. Is this fair? But no judging. Okay, thank you. Ready, are you accumulating 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity each week? It's, no, there's no judging, so it, it, it's, no one's judging anyone, it's fine. And by, by the way, if you're lying, there's a buzzer, and it buzzes. <laughs> so I noticed that happened, then people sat down. Okay, um, oh, sorry, can't leave that one yet. Are you strength training twice a week on non-consecutive days? The buzzer, it happened. Some people are just tired because they're not strength training. So they're sitting now, that's fine. Nutrition, are you consuming five servings of fruit and vegetable each day? Now I'm not saying five of fruit and five of vegetable, but that would be great. I'm saying a combined, every day combined, five servings. You'll get that today, okay? Nice. Sleep, this is where all the surgeons and physicians go bye-bye. Um, we'll just say it out, but anyway, seven to nine hours routinely. Bye-bye. Okay, again, there's no judging. I feel people are judging and judging themselves and judging others, no judging. Stress management. Do you have a go-to stress management technique that you utilize in a time of crisis? This is when, if you're working with people, they'll get you to sit down. In a time of crisis, and you practice 15 minutes a day of whatever stress resiliency technique, like yoga that you just saw, that counts. Walking in nature, deep breathing, you pick. Okay, wow, well, look at our crowd go. Oh, got a, little, got a little buzz, okay, or tired, tired, someone's tired. Okay, social connections. Are you connecting with someone and feel support from someone every day? At least seven times in the week, we'll say, the literature shows us. So seven times in the week, you are, okay. Do you have someone we call a charismatic, a charismatic adult, someone from whom you gather strength? You have someone in your life, if you're in a tough spot, you can call someone, okay? Are you a charismatic adult for someone else in this world? Okay? Now we get people to drop like flies here too, but okay, let's try. Let's try, let's try. It's not about tobacco, but yes, we'll start with that. If you do not smoke, it's a yes and you remain standing. Okay, here we go. I'm talking, I'm the messenger. American Heart Association guidelines. That's what I'm sharing with you right now. If you don't drink, don't start. And now, if you are a woman and you drink zero to one drinks a day, you remain standing. If you're a man and you drink zero to two drinks a day, 
you remain standing. Now, I've, I've, I've been in Greece, I'm part Greek, my grandparents came from Basara, around Sparta, and immigrated to East Boston, so I, I visit Greece, I give talks in, in, in Europe, and they always ask this question, so you may be asking it too. Does it count one at lunch and one at dinner? This is a 24-hour period. <laughs> Folks, this is a 24-hour period. Okay, wow, so I have several books, Rich, if you can look around, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's seven. Seven books to give out. Okay, so fun, fun. Now, you may sit or stand. You can remain standing. You, you, and anyone can stand up at any time during this presentation, by the way. Feel free to stand up and walk around. I do not mind. Um, why? Exercise is so, so important. Now, we have about 40 minutes from what I can tell uh, left, and we are gonna talk about each pillar those recommendations and why those recommendations are in place. The medical model. Now, I think Dr. McMacken, you learned a little bit about exercise and cardiovascular disease. Right, me too. In medical school, we learn a little bit about this, how exercise impacts cardiovascular disease. Helps prevent cardiac disease and stroke. We know this for many years. Reduces blood pressure, controls blood glucose. So essential for the reason that we're gathered together today. Actually can increase insulin sensitivity when we exercise. Control weight helps prevent obesity, helps prevent bone loss. We're on the osteoporosis, not just diabetes here. We're talking about everything and around chronic conditions. All right, can increase self-esteem, energy, improve mood, and decrease stress. For those of you that do exercise, because the majority of the room remains standing when I ask the question about aerobic activity, why do you exercise? Anybody, anybody, why? Yes? You feel good afterwards. Yeah. You swim, it's beautiful. I love it, getting ready for that feeling of relaxation after anybody else. Any other reasons? Yes? So you don't yell at your kids. I, I love your honesty. Thank you. See, that's beautiful. Okay, we've learned no shame, blame, guilt in this room. So we can be authentic and honest, and that's where it all starts with lifestyle medicine. Yes, so you're less stressed. I get that. I have a 24-year-old and a 22-year-old boy, both, two boys. So I understand exactly what you're saying. Anybody else? Reasons why you exercise? Better feeling good about yourself. Feel better about yourself. Yes, yes, yes. You want functionality. You want to be independent. You want to maintain your muscles. Yes, and you? You want to help my bones. You want to help your bones. Look, osteoporosis. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz. Yes. Increase your energy levels. Do you want to be productive? You want to be happy? Yes. Rachel. We've got an accountability partner that brings these exercises. Wow. Built in accountability. Love that. Somebody was over here. Move, love it, love it. Do you know how and why? I'm just curious, I don't know. You may not have been taught this by anybody. Most people don't know. I feel less achy. Oh, beautiful. Isn't that nice? Yes. Terrific. Again, someone was out over here. Longevity. Longevity, want to live a long life. Add life to years and years to life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful, okay. So I have a reason for exercising, and I did think one of you New Yorkers was gonna match mine. So wait, why do you exercise? <laughs> I'm sorry. Just, okay, ready? Why do you exercise? I'm just wondering if you're the answer. Why do I exercise? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the reasons people said, like longevity, stress yeah. management. Okay. Um, yeah. So no match. That's fine. I thought, I thought, I, yeah. So, so I exercise for? Brain. Brain? Sorry. What example? Example to my patients, that's a great, great point. I think you may know some of my research, but I'm not sure. So I exercise for my endothelial cells. I know, no one else says that. <laughs> I'm the, literally the only person that exercises for their endothelial cells. I want my endothelial cells to function well. I am worried about what? Oh, yes, I'm worried about a heart attack and a stroke, because I know I've got a family history that you can't get rid of that. I live with that since 18, I know that. And I don't want what I saw my dad in the hospital, not able to move one entire side of his body at 52. Okay, so this is the medical model, and it's been around for years. Many of us learned 
about cardiac disease. Now, I love to, to emphasize the mental health model. Interesting, no one said this, but improves sleep, one of our major pillars. Oh, did, you, did somebody say it and I missed it? Oh, okay. You thought it. Okay, okay, that counts. No, no, no. No, no, no. Thanks for being open because that counts. Stand up again. That absolutely counts. So we had it in the room in New York. I love it. Yes. So improve sleep. It's so important. We're going to get to the sleep pillar, but I'm going to ask you, does anyone know about amygdala flares? Ooh, this is a fun, okay. So it has something to do with sleep and it'll come up in a little bit. Better endurance, stress relief. This is the mental health model. Improvement in mood, ba-boom, ba-boom, such a big one. Increased energy and stamina. Reduced tiredness that can increase mental alertness. Weight reduction. And then lastly, they put on their list, reduced cholesterol, improved cardiovascular fitness. So it's just interesting to see the difference in the way the, the, the benefits are emphasized in the mental health model and the mental health model. I feel close to you guys, so I will share this. I didn't put it on here because, um, well, I had it for a CME at Harvard and I, I was uh, admonished for including it. So I'll say it here because we're a, closed, we're a closed environment. And the medical students usually mention this. Another benefit of exercise that was in the article, and that's why I put it in my Harvard CME material. It was from a medical literature article. It was just a fact. Anybody know what I was admonished for? Thank you. You said it. Wait, you said it. I didn't say it. You said it. Yeah, that's right. I didn't say it because it's being recorded. If anyone's have, I didn't say it. Okay. So, um, so, so here, this is from a medical. Uh, textbook, and you'll see my favorite one, and a cell function increases. When I show this to patients, you heard I'm also a health coach, they look at that with a blank stare. They do not care one thing about that chart. No, not one thing. Now they start looking. Huh, your brain loves the gym, that's really fascinating. So I hope I'm gonna teach you something. Anyone know BDNF in the room? Raise your hand, and I will ask you what it is. Are you ready? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, brain factor. Brilliant. Uh, skeletal muscles. Release it during exercise, and that results in increased hypocapital volume, associated with increased cognitive performance. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big Yes, absolutely. That, that, whoops, I'm, okay, that's a big step. Yes, yep. So we're going to go through this for everyone else. You're going to see a picture of exactly, sorry, what was your name? Visvanada. Uh, Vis. Exactly what Vis said, okay. But here you go. People don't know this. Doctors don't know this. Healthcare providers don't know this. When you exercise, you release dopamine. Improves motivation, focus, and learning. Blood flow, you know this. Enhances, increases, so you get oxygen to your brain, removal of waste. That one people know. Serotonin is released. This is why we have an improved mood. We have studies, the SMILE study, comparing serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so that's increasing serotonin, an antidepressant, versus placebo versus exercise, 150 minutes each week. And the serotonin levels go up the same in the medicine and the exercise. And the depressive symptoms go down the same. I'm not telling you to get rid of your antidepressants or your patients to get rid of them. No, I'm not. That's very good medicine. But I'm saying maybe like Dr. McMackin, they're on it and then you add some exercise in and you get them exercising. Maybe they don't have to take the antidepressant for the rest of their lives. I'm not against medicine, be clear. But I'm just trying to share that there are some other things that we may be able to do to help our patients and help ourselves. Endorphins are released. Anyone get an endorphin rush? rush just raise your hand if you do. I'm just curious because a lot of people don't. Exactly. Majority of our audience does not. I do. I'm a runner. I love it. I've been doing it since I was a teenager for my brain, for my health, for my mental health. And I get a runner's high. So I don't, I didn't need drugs. I'm like, I don't need drugs. I, I just got to go for a run. And what's funny is somebody said, well, you want to be an example. I thought it was to my, to my kids, but it, it's also for patients. But so for example, I have two boys. What does one do when he's stressed? What does one do? One of them. Yes, he runs. He also says it's for his mental health. Where did he get that? I don't know. So norepinephrine is released, improves attention, perception, and motivation. Here's our BDNF. Miracle grow for the brain. Miracle grow for the brain. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Increases neurogenesis. When I was at Stanford, I learned that there were certain number of neurons. You had to protect them. 
So yeah, we're rollerblading at Stanford. You rollerbladed to class, true. But you always had a helmet. So we were always protecting our neurons. And I'm still protecting my neurons, sure. But I realized that all this exercise is really helping me increase the number of neurons in my brain. Protect and repair neurons from injury, degeneration. We know this in PT, in physiatry. What is a stroke patient? You're getting them up and out and, and trying to get them moving again, using their muscles. Hormones combined with BDNF. Do you know which hormone just to, this, this just to put you on the spot? I'm, tr I'm hoping I'm gonna teach you something. Do you know which, which hormone binds with BDNF? I'm gonna send it to you. Mental telepathy here, go, go, go. Okay, we'll come to it, not yet. Um, so hormones combine with BDNF to increase the number of neurons and synapses. Also, as you heard from these, you can change the structure of your brain. This is very powerful information. Helping your endothelial cells, eh, people don't really care so much. Changing the structure of the brain, they care a lot. You can increase the size of your hippocampus by MRI. They're looking at the volume of the hippocampus. What does the hippocampus do? Memory, helps with memory. We have diabetes, we have obesity, we have dementia. Everybody's worried about those. This speaks to people, speaks volumes to people. So you know this, United States Health and Human Services, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity in the week. What does moderate mean? You can talk and not sing. If you, I think a lot of you are doing vigorous right now. That means you can't even talk when you're doing it. If you're doing that, then the requirement is 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous physical activity in the week. Then don't forget that strength training. So here we go to Visa's point right here. Your muscles are metabolically active. You just heard it from Visa. They do release a myokine called irisin. That's what Vis was thinking. And here, irisin, we're in a diabetes conference. Please look at the pancreas. Increased beta cell regeneration and function. Increased beta cell survival. This is critical for patients with diabetes. Now you know, and you probably knew before coming in here, when you exercise, increase glucose uptake. We're gonna help with our glucose levels, and we recommend that Patients who have prediabetes or diabetes are taking walks, exercise snacks, before, walk, before eating, after eating, through the day, it's helpful. You can see that irisin also works on adipose tissue, and I want to point out that it works on the brain. It says here, appetite regulation. All of these are interconnected, these pillars. So many of you may know when you exercise regularly, it's not one bout of exercise, but when you're exercising regularly, say for four weeks, you often decrease cravings. This could be irisin, or it could be lactate. Who knows N-lactoyl phenylalanine? This is a new metabolite found at Stanford in, I believe it was June, yep, June 2022. And this has been associated with decreased feeding. And that is released when we exercise. And lactoyl phenylalanine, lactate. That could be another reason why people who exercise are experiencing less cravings and are reducing the amount of food that they intake. It's complex, but these could be. This is why I love lifestyle medicine, because I love getting to the science. Why? What's happening? How is it happening in that way? So you're sitting. It's hard because you know sitting is the new smoking, and I'm looking at you all smoking. So it, 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 if you want to stand, go ahead. It's up to you. But if you want to remain s sitting, you may get into sedentary physiology. You may not be aware of this, but lipoprotein lipase decreases, triglycerides increase, HDL decreases, and glucose control is disrupted. The American Diabetes Association recommends those with prediabetes and diabetes stand up every half hour. All the rest of, of us, or people that do not have prediabetes or diabetes, are to stand every hour. Interconnection you already saw through Iverson and Lacfee. This is research that you know and you've probably done on yourself and with others and with, with patients. Exercise reduces urges for sugary snacks and attenuates urges in response to stress situation and the cue in overweight people. So I, I, I have nothing against Wagovi. 
And I think Wagovi is a powerful medicine. It can really help many, many people. You're going to be on it for your whole life. That's tough. Can we get you to a place where you're doing a lot of exercise, maybe releasing the iris and maybe helping with appetite suppression, or Lacfi helping with appetite suppression, and, and then you're experiencing less cravings, maybe. So we talked a lot about diet already. This is Dr. David Katz. He's a former president of the American College of Life Science and a good friend now. And I admire his work very much. He is a very logical thinker. He's very organized. So a decade ago, and I heard him, I was just with him on Friday, and uh, I've heard him speak on this. This is an annual review in public health. He usually did this every five years or was planning to do it at least every 10, but he says this still stands, and I agree. Look at the different diets, dietary approaches. Low carb, low fat, vegetarian, vegan, low glycemic, Mediterranean, mixed balanced, you could put a dash in there, and then paleolithic. These are all variety of dietary patterns we hear. And you heard from Dr. Rosenfeld, um, keto, Atkins. By the way, keto can be vegan. So different names for different eating patterns. But what is in common? That's his point. He started a true health initiative to find what's in common. Well, let's look. The compatible healthy elements of all these different diets. Limit refined starches. You heard that from Dr. Rosenfeld already. Limit added sugars. Limit processed foods. Limit the intake of certain fats, and you know that's trans fats, saturated fats. Emphasis on whole plant foods with or without. This is where you all asked. Lean meats, fish, poultry, seafood. Get into the debate about that. But limiting it, eliminating it as part of the whole food plant predominant dietary pattern is what we're doing at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and Research, as you already heard, is ongoing. Who knows who said this summary statement? Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Michael yes, Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan. And it's very good advice. Let's talk about vegan. When you're vegan, you know that you're not eating animal product. But what are you eating? Could be chips, <laughs> right? It could, it could be um, uh, um, multiple other processed foods that aren't from animal product. It doesn't define what you're eating. It defines what you're not eating. We don't want to be eating processed foods, ultra-processed foods. The data is out on this, and I'm going to say everyone agrees on this. And that's because the data is so powerful. So for each additional serving of ultra-processed food, all-cause mortality increased by 18%. You can see ultra-processed food consumption servings per day on your x-axis, y-axis is all-cause mortality. So now you're asking yourself, huh, what's a serving? First of all, we need to teach our patients whatever it is. You've got to look at your ingredients and your package label. I did have a patient who said, this is unbelievable. Look at this cookie. And I'm thinking, oh, no. And it's a huge cookie, about the size of my head. It's a massive cookie. And he's so excited to say, I found these cookies. There's only 15 calories. I'm like, what? I mean, there is no way. So he said, oh, wow. Wee, wowie, wow, woo. I wonder what could be in that cookie. Could you do me a big favor? Could you get the package? No, it's in the garbage. Oh, it's in the garbage. Could you go into your garbage for me, please? Because we're, we're meeting by Zoom. Could you go into your garbage? Do you mind? I mean, is there anything really gross? No? OK. So dip your hand in there. Get that package for me. Get it out. Guess how many servings were in a cookie? 15. I mean, who does that to someone? How? That's just, that's criminal. Anyway, so chips, one ounce or 18 chips is, is a serving. Now let's get into this data. Because you heard, Dr. Roosevelt, what's important is what are you eating? Yeah, that's what I say all the time. What are you eating? A meta-analysis of cohort studies, this is not small study. This is half a million people. Participants found that a higher intake of fruit and vegetables associated with a reduced risk of death from cardiovascular disease. Average reduction in risk of 4% for each additional serving per day of fruit and vegetable. This literature has been around for a while, but we don't talk about it. Why? Let's talk about it. Nurses study, compared with those in the lowest category of fruit and vegetable intake, that's less than 1.5 servings a day. Those who averaged eight or more servings, guess how many I'm trying to have every day, guess. This is a cool, they showed, I, I've been waiting for a chance to do this. 
They, I've never seen a pointer like this. They show this is like brand new stuff. Yeah, that eight. Yes, eight or more servings a day. We're 30% less likely to have had a heart attack or stroke. So you know I'm going for eight. Individuals who ate more than five servings of fruit and vegetables per day had roughly a 20% lower risk of coronary heart disease and stroke compared with individuals who ate less than three servings. So some is better than none, just like exercise. Get people to eat some. Get people to do some walking. Get them up higher. More is better. Get them up to eight. Now, why? See, I'm always the why, and I know many of you are the why, too, because you're New Yorkers. <laughs> we like to get to the root of this. This is, it. this is the way we are. So why? Yes, I get it. Vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. That's good enough for me. But that's not always good enough for everyone else. So what else is in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains? And those carbs that people are saying are awful. Whole grains are carbs. Fruits and vegetables do have carbs. They're not awful. What do they have? They have fiber. Do you know that we're a fiber deficient nation and who's talking about it? Nobody. Nobody's talking about we're a fiber deficient nation. Not one person. 5% of us are getting the amount of fiber that is required, which by WHO is 25 to 29 grams of fiber. How many of you, again, just look down, how many of you are getting about that a day? Yeah, so we're fiber deficient, not, not all of us in the room, but most people are fiber deficient. How does it come into diabetes? Well, we know by research that when you're consuming that amount of fiber, 25 to 29 grams a day, you can lower the incidence of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, colon cancer. Why though? Why? Hmm. Because when we eat fiber, the microbiome ferments it. Why do we care? Anybody, anybody? What? Why do we care? I'm going to always go to you. Because of the chemicals which are part of our brain. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. We take it. So they ferment the fiber and create short chain fatty acids like acetate, propionate, and butyrate. You may have heard of those before. Why do we care about those? We care about those because those have an influence on our metabolism, on host metabolism, immune system, and cell, pro cell proliferation. That's not good enough for you New Yorkers, so here you go. Here's your dietary fiber. Here's your gut microbiome. There are your short chain. Fat oh, let me use my click. My yeah, there's your short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Go through the L cell of the gut. Increase GLP-1. I've been talking about this since 2019. No one cared. Now everyone sees this. Hmm. Increase PYY, increase proglucagon, increase L cell proliferation. I have to tell you that this natural GLP-1 lasts for minutes. Right? We'll go v, you, you, it's, it's a week. So it's not, it's not comparable. But if you're eating fiber, you can get a boost in your GLP-1, short-lived. But if you do this three times a day, short-lived three times a day. Why do you care? That also impacts energy metabolism, glucose metabolism, lipid metabolism, lowers inflammation, helps with immunity, and decreases our risk for cancer. Here's a healthy plate. This is from Walter Willett, Harvard Healthy Plate. Walter Willett, eat Lancet. He is the guru that I follow and have followed for years, probably two decades. He is the, was the chair, he just stepped down, of nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So he has been studying the science of nutrition for his entire career. Just had him speak at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Annual Conference in Denver in 2023. Important announcement. If you haven't been paying attention, please pay attention now. The annual conference for 2024 celebrating our 20th anniversary is still open. There's 1,000 seats, Rich. We're still, we're still open. I just checked with our executive director. We will sell out, though. He's correct. We're going, every year we sell out. And this anniversary year, we're going to sell out. So please do come. OK. Walter Willett spoke in 2023 at our annual conference. We get amazing speakers. And he talked about, yes, this healthy eating plate. You heard about the government's plate. Now, this plate has water, then half fruits and vegetables, quarter whole grain, quarter healthy protein. And they know, choose fish, poultry, beans, nuts, limit red meat and cheese, avoid bacon, cold cuts and other processed meats because they're carcinogenic and there is evidence as Dr. Rosenfeld shared that red meat itself is carcinogenic, processed or unprocessed. So when you look at the healthy plate, healthy people, healthy planet on the left, which is Eat Lancet from Dr. Walter Willett and international experts, you'll see a very similar plate. It has an allocation 
It has an allocation for animal sourced protein, which is like a hamburger a week, uh, and, and some dairy food. But in general, it is plant foods, plants, eating plants, nuts, seeds, legumes. How do you get your protein? Nuts, seeds, legumes, beans, vegetables even have, peas have a great amount of protein. It's shocking for many people. Now we're doing diabetes, so let's go to the American Diabetes Association plate. Whoa, it looks very similar. Vegetables are there on, on half the plate. And then you have carbohydrate foods where they're including starchy veggies, potatoes, corn, winter squash, and fruit. Yes, wonder if you can eat fruit. The American Diabetes Association says, yes, you can have fruit if you are someone who has prediabetes, diabetes, or you're worried about diabetes. Now, that's a revelation for many people, including physicians. That is, that is from the American Diabetes Association. Plenty from there, protein sources there. Plenty of protein-rich, plant-based options, beans, hummus, lentils, and others. We're all moving in that direction. American College of Lifestyle Medicine is helping lead the way with many, many resources that are for free. You can even get them if you're not a member. If you're a member, I think you have access to more resources and more courses. But this is in Spanish in multiple languages. You can get How to Eat on a Budget, this dietary spectrum, helping lead people go from the American, standard American diet, you know that's the SAD diet, to the whole food plant predominant diet. We're talking about diabetes, but diabetes is connected to so many other conditions like depression. So food for mood, what, what should you eat if you're interested in your mood? You can exercise and you can have fruit and vegetables because those are associated with decreased incidence of depression. Now how are these eating patterns disrupted? Stress. Stress increases the desire for hyperpalatable foods, foods that have salt and sugar and fat layered upon each other like a french fry from a fast food. Dad ate tons of those. And it is likely the high cortisol levels that are partially responsible for our gravitation to these hyperpalatables when we are overstressed. <laughs> what is stress? <laughs> You're New Yorkers, you know exactly what stress is. <laughs> Engineering term pressure or tension exerted on a material object. We're talking about this psychological stress, a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. We are in these circumstances and have been for many, many years. Some could argue pre, pre COVID, healthcare was in a state of extreme stress. So some stress helps us get to the deadline. I had to get here on time. There was a day I had to show up. I had to be, I had to plan. I had to, there's stress in getting, driving, getting here on time. OK, but th that helps me to perform, to get up here and get myself here. If you said, come give a talk at some point, if Dr. Rosenfeld said, hey, can you give me a talk, give a talk at SUNY Downstate sometime, I'd be like, yeah, sure. Without a deadline, it's never going to happen. You need deadlines, deadlines for chapters, research, articles, et cetera. So some stress helps us to get peak performance, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about stress that is so intense and so chronic that it starts to deteriorate our system. Where? The hippocampus. Don't worry, because you've probably felt stress, and now you're worried about your hippocampus, because what can you do to counteract that? In chorus. Thank you. Perfect. How is it that stress impacts us so deeply? We know this. It's through our brain. We get signals through the, the hypothalamus, then the HPA axis. You know about this. Your adrenal gland releasing the cortisol, the epinephrine. Then you get pro-inflammatory activation. And behind many of these chronic conditions is simmering inflammation. Stress is just adding to that. And we know that stress creates behavioral changes, eating, what we shouldn't, perhaps going to substances and not exercising. There's also the cardiometabolic changes that happen with increased hypertension with stress. How about stress, depression, diabetes? It's all interrelated. Look at the research, look at the literature. Chronic psychological stress, increase in the HPA axis, that increases the cortisol, which increases intra-abdominal fat, as you know increasing waist circumference. We talk a lot about BMI, but we're really talking about distribution of fat and where we have lean muscle and where we don't. And then the autonomic nervous system activation with the increased epinephrine, norepinephrine, leads to, look, our topic today, insulin resistance, increased hemoglobin A1C, increased triglycerides, lowering our good cholesterol HDL. And then stress itself leads to inflammation, increased IL-6, increased C-reactive protein, and then my favorite, endothelial dysfunction, 
that stress, I want to remain stress-free, as you all want to. So I'm going to give you 14 evidence-based ways to do so. Get out into nature, forest bathing. You can look it up here. Exercise we discussed. Mindfulness. We did a little bit of that with yoga. There's mindfulness-based stress reduction, John Kabat-Zinn's program. I did that in 2014. Wow, a decade ago now. It was life-changing. You can do an eight-week course, CME course. I did a five-day intensive in mindfulness-based stress reduction for physicians and for patients, because we're one and the same. Meditation changes your brain. You can increase your prefrontal cortex. Playing with your pet releases oxytocin when you pet that furry animal. Okay, someone's going to say, what about a turtle? What about a lizard? Thank you. <laughs> Everyone always asks that. I'll just ask it myself. The literature isn't there, so I'm not sure. I think it's the furriness that allows for the oxytocin release, but I'm not sure. So if you do have a pet or that's a turtle or a lizard, you can see for yourself, do your own experiment. Does it release oxytocin and reduce your own stress? Take your vacation. Who takes vacation? Yes. The Europeans all raise their hand, and it's two weeks in August. And you know that for a fact. We don't take our vacation. Some of you are. Majority are not. Who takes deep breaths throughout the day like we were just led in? I do. Turn on that parasympathetic. I love it. Diaphragmatic breathing turns on parasympathetic. Music. Medical students use this number one way to reduce stress. What kind of music? People always ask. Depends who you're talking to. If it's my brother, it's Led Zeppelin. Awful. But that, he loves Led Zeppelin. I like classical. Whatever, whatever works for you to reduce your stress. Practicing yoga, you just did it. Laughing, I love it, as you know. And that reduces stress. Expressive writing reduces stress. Something simple like chewing gum. You're not to do that in this theater. Uh, checking email less frequently. That's much harder. If you can get a handle on your email, that'll really improve your stress level. Sleep. OK, we, we, we don't have that much time left, but I'm going to go through the rest of the pillars with you. These are more straightforward. Sleep. You need seven to nine hours of sleep. National Sleep Foundation. They've done the research, not me. And I'll show you the research as to why that seven to nine hours is in place. Nap, people ask, especially in Europe. <laughs> yes. Napping, the siesta, 20 minutes before 3 PM. It won't disrupt your nighttime sleep. Here's the data. This is why it's seven to nine hours. So duration in hours on your x-axis, hazard ratio incident CVDs on your y-axis. Look at the nadir right there, eight hours. Seven to nine hours, that's our goal because we want to reduce our number one killer, which is heart disease. Sleep deprivation, maybe you're surprised to see diabetes listed here, maybe you're not. But they, it impacts, sleep deprivation impacts these conditions, high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. And we know this, and we know data about this that I'm sharing, you may not know, five nights of sleep restricted to four hours per night results in 24% decrease in insulin sensitivity, 30% decrease in acute insulin response to intravenous glucose. This is important for diabetes, prediabetes and diabetes. Lots of endocrinologists do not ask about sleep. It's very important. Go back and talk about sleep with anyone who's working on their blood glucose control. Yes, ask about exercise and irisin and all this, but don't forget sleep. Now, I like to talk about mood. Many of you mentioned exercise helps with the mood. Well, guess what? What amount of sleep is recommended for mood? This happens to be the same, seven to nine. Now, something that impacts most of you, although I know many New Yorkers do not drive because you take other forms of transportation, but it's very important to realize when we have residents and they're going home and they are driving, I was one, uh, and in, actually as a medical student, after my surgery rotation, I fell asleep at the wheel. Has anyone fallen asleep at the wheel? is the most scary thing, I think, that has happened to me personally, and it changed the way I interacted with sleep, and that was back in 1996. But there's data now looking at reaction time of those that are sleep deprived and those that have in, 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 uh, had alcohol. So reaction time reduces with sleep deprivation. Reaction time reduces with consumption of alcohol. This is from Australian study. Being awake 18 hours, your reaction time is similar to someone who has a blood alcohol 0.05. Being awake 24 hours, which we ask our residents to do, uh, blood, their reaction time is similar to someone that has a blood alcohol of 0.10, and you know 0.08 is legally drunk. Food for thought, we need to think about it. I tell the residents to take an Uber home after call. Well, that's because I fell asleep at the wheel. So when they are home, and when you are home, and you are in control of your sleep, and you are not on call, 
Make your bedroom like a cave, quiet, use earplugs, use white noise, use pink noise, rain, use whatever you need. I know it's New York and it might be very loud where you are, so get earplugs or some white noise. Cool, did you know this? You want your bedroom to be 67 degrees, that's the sweet spot, but between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You need it dark, blackout curtains, I use them. Uh, maybe you want an eye mask, it depends where you live. I know you're in New York, so light is coming at all hours of the night if you're in the city. So you've got to know that and do something about it. You know you want to avoid blue wavelength light, blocks melatonin. You know that melatonin is released by the, by the pineal gland, and the pineal gland will be blocked if it gets blue wavelength light. So put your, your laptop away, your cell phone away, two hours to three hours before bed. Now you can't do that. Blue wavelength blocking glasses, blue wavelength blocking apps. Anybody know the half-life of caffeine? Six hours, four to six hours, about six hours, good. Anyone know the receptor caffeine binds to? Many of you have been through medical school. Thank you so much, Fies. I love it. I'm giving him the microphone for the rest. Uh, yes, adenosine. Do you know why we care that caffeine binds to adenosine? Okay. Throughout the day, ATP is used. Adenosine builds up around 11 p.m. You'd be at your maximum if you did not have caffeine within 12 hours of that period of time. For some people, it varies. Adenosine is that signal for sleep. So if you have caffeine close to bedtime, caffeine binds to that receptor, not adenosine, and you do not get the signal for sleep. It's the opposite effect. It revs up your cells. Adrenal gland responds by producing adrenaline. So we need to ask our patients about caffeine. Now, how does sleep deprivation impact food consumption? Sleep insufficiency is associated with significant increase in desire for weight gain promoting high calorie food items following sleep loss, the magnitude of which is proportional to subjective severity of sleep loss. Let's give numbers, you New Yorkers, because you want them. Volunteers who slept only four hours ate 300 extra calories compared to those who got nine hours. What else does sleep impact? You know, mood, outlook, productivity, creativity, sociability, relationships. I mentioned the amygdala flare. If you're sleep deprived, you're 30% more likely to have an amygdala flare where you are emotional and irrational, and your prefrontal cortex, or your CEO of your brain, is not helping you. Your amygdala is speaking only. So, Sleep is essential for a healthy lifestyle. Now, social connection, important pillar. Vivek Murthy has said we are in a loneliness epidemic. Well, we have known the power of social connection since 1979. Lisa Berkman, who was in California at this time of the study, and she was working from 1969 to 1974, um, uh, she put together with Syme, Leonard Syme, this analysis, following Alameda County residents, men and women, you can see both sides, this is a bar graph, we have age on the x-axis, percentage died from all causes in this prospective, it was a nine-year study. So, no, I do, it's good, I, got, I, I don't have much time, I'm a little stressed, I'm sweating, but I'm gonna get through it. They're, they're, they're pushing, no. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, we got it. So, so here, look, women, men, all ages, 30 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69. Now, how many connections did they have? Least connected, that's the diagonal lines. Every age group, both men and women, over the nine years, they were the most likely to die if they had the least connections. Men, women, every age group. That's what you need to remember. Now, why is that? Research is there. Low quality and quantity of social ties is linked with development and progression of cardiovascular disease, recurrent heart attack, atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, cancer, delayed cancer recovery, slower wound healing. They're getting stressed. I think I'm going over. Let's see how it works. Everybody breathe deep. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. I have a mic and the, the clicker, so I'm going over here. Um, so, social connection is so important. The social structure the structural social network aspect, and then the functional network aspects. Looking at social support, social exchange, social engagement, all this impacts the health pathway over here. It impacts how, if we're smoking and drinking, how we're managing our stress, if we're exercising, our self-efficacy coping, our cardiovascular immune function, 
Our social connection is powerful. Robert Waldinger knows this. I'm going to give you the bottom line. Guess what he says from his study of 80 years looking at Harvard graduates, their families, and inner city people in Boston. He says that taking care of your body is important, but tending to your relationships is a form of self-care that is so important. And that's the revelation he's come out of this 80-year study with. The power of connection. He wrote, even wrote a book on it. So how are social connections disrupted? Oops, substance use. Absolutely. And you know during the pandemic, this went up. For providers and patients alike. Why? Because they were bored? Because they had increased stress. So let me cut to the chase. I already told you what the American Heart Association says about alcohol. Let's talk about alcohol and diabetes. I'm, oh, don't worry, don't worry, Rich. I've got, I just, this is the last slide. Ready? <laughs> So normally, the liver releases glucose, maintains blood sugar levels. But when you drink alcohol, the liver is busy breaking down the alcohol. So it does a poor job of releasing glucose into the bloodstream. This leads to drop in blood sugar levels. Do the diabetes patients know this? And the problem is, then it's hard to know, is it from the alcohol? Is it the low blood sugar that you're experiencing this drowsiness, confusion, dizziness? It's important that we teach them about the limits and the dangers of alcohol. One drink is a beer, five ounces of wine, or 1.5 ounces of distilled spirits. Now I have to say, to conclude, I am the messenger of this message. <laughs> Thank you. It's been around for at least six, well, almost a decade now. For cancer prevention, no alcohol is a recommendation. If you read The Lancet in 2023, you can go deeper into that. But they say there's no safe dose of alcohol for cancer. I just want to share that alcohol impacts sleep. It reduces REM sleep. You may think it helps people fall asleep, and it may, but it disrupts their sleep. So it's not high quality sleep. It can disrupt your relationship, your eating pattern, all so many things. And we are all patients, and group coaching is what I do for surgeons and physicians now at Mass General. You could join me there, or I could start doing it here. Who knows? But this is a free bundle for you if you're interested in lifestyle medicine. You can get 5.5 free CME, CE, and learn more about nutrition, food as medicine, food as medicine for health and for disease, and an intro to lifestyle medicine. And that does complete our journey together through the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry for going over. Oh, 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 oh. Wow. I love New York. <laughs> I love New York. I, I, I just knew this was going to feel so good. Thank you so, so much for that. It really, it really touches me deeply. It means a lot. And Rich will be less mad now that I went over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Fuzzy. Yes. I'm going to ask that maybe you hold your questions. One of the things that's amazing is that Dr. Frades is going to be with us yes. for the entire afternoon. She will be part of the networking session this afternoon. So everyone will have a chance to interact with Dr. Frades at that session. So if you have questions, could you please hold them for her for that session because we still have more that we need to do and I really need to get us to lunch on time so that the rest of the day isn't, isn't delayed. Um, so with that, I'd like, it, and what we had on the agenda to, coming up next was a video with um, Mayor Eric Adams and we will be showing that. We're gonna show it during lunch instead. So when, when you go to the other room where we're serving lunch, that video will be playing there if you're interested in that. Um, so with that, I think that we're going to move on to our panel presentation. Our next panel, which is going to be led by um, Dr. Rosenfeld and, and our healthcare providers. And I think I'm gonna let, um, let Rich introduce his panelists. No, that was fantastic. So. Uh, this is our, our first panel, and it's uh, uh, about incorporating these principles that we've been speaking about into your, your practice. And I'll introduce our three participants uh, in just a second. Introducing our panel, let's see. We have uh, Sandy, why don't uh, 
Uh, you go first, and I'm going to ask them to just real quickly, a minute or two at most, just say what's their interest in lifestyle medicine, uh, diabetes, and we need the very quick fun fact. Okay, so Sandy, go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Sandy. I'm currently an endocrine fellow at Mount Sinai, and after seeing how big of a change lifestyle can make on my patients, it's definitely motivated me to want to continue doing that for my entire career. Yeah, I'm short, so. <laughs> And just like uh, Michelle was kind of saying, when you realize how much of a difference lifestyle can make, that is 100% what I wanted to do. And I actually got my hands dirty in medical school back at Dartmouth with culinary medicine. So it was actually teaching patients in a teaching kitchen how to make these healthy meals. And that's what really showed me that there's so much more health education that we have to go out and do. And I'm so glad that you guys are all here to help us go forward with that. My fun fact is that I have a community garden, which is a 10 by 20 foot square plot, and I actually made stickers that said Nibble Farms and Residency, and I would give out bags of zucchini and tomato to the other residents. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Dr. McMacken, we've heard from already, but fill in the blanks. All right, I'm going to skip over my lifestyle interest and diabetes interest because I talked about that. Um, and I'm going to go right to my fun fact. So um, my fun fact is actually that I get called a lot of different names. And no one seems to be able to pronounce my last name, um, even though it's phonetic. And so one of my favorite things that I get called is Big Mac. And that's ironic for someone who's recommending plant-based eating, but I'll take it. Um, and I get called other things too, but I'll, I'll keep them to myself so I don't persist the, uh, the problem. That's, that's a great fun fact. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan? Thank you. Uh, first of all, Jonathan Weber uh, from the Yale uh, School of Medicine uh, and the faculty at the PA program. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm just not close yeah, enough. Good. Or... And uh, like Dr. McMacken, tried to work on that. You, that is Thank perfect. You. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I found myself after 10 years uh, in clinical practice wondering why lifestyle medicine was only a top sliver of the recommendations, and then it unveiled into multi-dose uh, medications or multi, uh, multiple medications for treating diabetes. And I, after 10 years, I couldn't believe why was I never trained? Where can I get this training? And I think about myself as, a, again, one of the multidisciplinary caregivers here, and I'm so happy that you are receiving it today that I wish I would have gotten 28 years ago and that, we are, uh, that I feel privileged about sitting with these titans um, and with all of you. So my fun fact, um, I am a former ballet dancer wow. and uh, pr uh, danced what ballet for about 15 years in my uh, early 20s and mid-30s. And I, I use that as a as a way to, to challenge my students by saying, if you're always in your left brain, you'll never be in your right mind. Mm. <laughs> so I challenge you all to uh, keep that corpus callosum uh, active. That's awesome. Well, I've already been introduced, but the fun fact was going to be the running, but I'll give you a different one. Um, so I play accordion and sing and used to do professional in restaurants, walking around in an Italian restaurant from table to table with my accordion singing, okay? So, <laughs> interesting. Mm -hmm. We have all have these dark secrets. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> okay, and you're gonna all need to write your fun fact on your name tag so we can uh, see it during uh, the networking session. Uh, real quick intro to diabetes, and then we're going to go through the, some of the, the pillars. We, we've seen a bit about this, but I love this uh, study in general. It just shows the rise, the rise, which, uh, and this ends in 2017. I'm sure it's even higher now. And it's interesting that there's a cadre, about 3.5% of U.S. adults who don't even know they have it, but they have it, 11% who have it, and then 
about three and a half percent who are just uh, undiagnosed. So um, it, it's huge. And then, as we said before, pre-diabetes is like another 37, 38 percent of folks. So uh, it's a big, big deal. Diabetes. If it wasn't, you wouldn't be here listening to this, right? So big deal. Uh, we spoke about our guideline a, a little bit earlier. And uh, actually, Jonathan is on our panel, our, what we call our guideline development uh, group for this. And this guideline's a little different than other ones out there. In it, We start with a relentless focus on quality, actually the way we come up with our recommendations. And many of you have seen guidelines that are several hundred pages long with literally dozens, if not 100 or 200 recommendations. We're very parsimonious. We have about 13 or 14 recommendations in this whole guideline, and every one of them is intended to be a quality improvement opportunity. Very pragmatic, that if you do this, you're gonna provide better care. So that's what we focus on. We develop what are called key action statements, act, asking people to do something, and then we support it with evidence profiles. So, in this, for the structure of this uh, talk uh, panel, what I'll be doing is for our, several of our main statements, I'll show you the statement and the profile, and then I'm gonna torture our three participants here on elaborating on you know, some of those uh, uh, aspects. So these are draft things that are in progress with ACLM. We have a very lovely draft of the guideline that's getting some review now. And as I said, probably first quarter of 2025, 20, uh, I would expect it to, to be published. And I think it's going to be great. So this is a typical statement. So physical activity, you should prescribe physical activity with an emphasis on aerobic and muscle strength training, which a lot of you sat down before when Dr. Frady's asked you about two days a week of strength training, and do it by being fit. Frequency, intensity, time, and type framework with SMART goals. And I, I won't go through this for time purposes, but what you're seeing here is called an action statement profile. So. When we develop a recommendation, we look at the strength of the evidence. How robust is it? Are we convinced that there's a preponderance of benefit in doing what we're asking the doctor or the clinician or the healthcare professional to do? And any value judgments that go into it. These will be in the guideline when published, so I won't go into it here. But here's for the panel. And what I've done is, when we have these statements, we have supporting text. So there's a couple of paragraphs or even sometimes a couple of pages of background going into these statements. And I went through each section and picked out some key words that I thought were, were good. And we're going to do this lightning round style because I want to get through it. Uh, uh, we're the only thing between you and lunch at the moment, which is a horrible thing to be, but it is. Um, so I'd ask our participants to really limit any response, you know, just to 60 seconds. I know that, Sandy, you said physical activity you wanted to speak about, so go speak about something there. Okay, really quick, I'll speak as fast <laughs> as a New Yorker, you guys will all understand. But one of the things is that with continuous versus high intensity exercise, there's so many options that patients have. So like uh, Dr. Frades was talking about before, even getting in a 10, 20 minute walk after each meal, it all adds up and helps lower the blood sugars. Mm. So one of the big things is that 75% of patients don't even meet the basic exercise requirements at this time. So how can you take someone who's sedentary and suddenly say, I want you to exercise five times a week for a half hour? Even I couldn't do that. And so one of the big things that I focus on for my patients is meeting them where they are and starting small. So one of the things that I like to do is standing, taking those standing breaks right after every 30 minutes to an hour, whatever they can do, and especially getting them to walk after meals. Because if you guys think about it, at dinner time, you eat your food, and then you're on the couch watching TV, relaxing for the rest of the nights. So that's one of the big things that I like to focus on is start off by walking right after dinner. And especially if you can do after meals, that's even better 
but that dinner time one is one that I really like to hit because the A1Cs all, or the sugars actually go higher after dinner because of melatonin being higher too. So that's a really good spot to start with your patients. Great information, but it was about a two to three minutes, 60 seconds. Um, <laughs> Michelle, do you have anything quick to add on this? No, because I was literally going to talk about postprandial oh, okay. exercise, Jonathan. so we got, we got that. Simply uh, echoing, connecting with the patient, getting them started with something that they can do, whether it's in their home, uh, whether it's in the office. I've been doing soleus push-ups. Mm. S since I've been up here. Did any of you notice that? <laughs> we can I've see it. actually <laughs> learned mm -hmm. about soleus push-ups. You can actually have your patient during your clinic visit do soleus push-ups um, in your office. Just to it's, get it's them a started. leg muscle, just, just sort of to, lifting your, your, your to, legs up. Lifting and your down. legs up on your toes, up and down. Yeah. Up and down. Up and down. It actually reduces hemoglobin A1C. Simple things, starting small, incremental, yeah. mm -hmm. progress over perfection. You got it. As they say, exercise snacks, right? Little, little exercise bits there. And make sure you keep in mind there's aerobic, there's strength. You need both. You can't just do the aerobic. And even beyond that, we don't really talk about it, but you need impact. You need something to bang your bones every once in a while, whether it's jumping, jogging, running, because uh, that keeps your bones strong. And then Joanne will be happy, Dr. Katz, if your bones are strong. Um, a corollary to this, and it, you know, was not just to get more activity, but reduce your sedentary time. You know, and they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, and this is a strong recommendation as I mentioned before, we had so many systematic reviews and the evidence is so robust. Um, I've, I've done a lot of guidelines and I've never seen evidence as robust as for lifestyle interventions. I mean, there, it, it's just an orgy of evidence supporting this stuff, but it's not, people don't know it. So sedentary times, uh, sitting is the new smoking. So Dr. McMacken, let's start with you here. Any yes thing resonate with you? I mean, I think that it's, it's really important for people to just be aware of how much they're sitting and just in a, helping them understand that um, any, any movement at all, even standing up is great. Um, one of the things I've worked on with patients is if you are sitting and watching TV, um, nowadays you might be watching on a channel where there's not commercials because you might be streaming, um, but if you are watching where there are commercials, standing up during commercials and maybe walking in mm. place during the commercial and then sitting back down if you want to sit back down, but getting into that rhythm of doing that um, is great. Yeah, Jonathan? <laughs> I, I tried to ask, we always want to assess, right? Assess where our patients are first. And I, I think uh, first and foremost, you know, I always ask, try to ask provocative and paradigm shifting questions. Zoom, or I, I'm sorry, the, 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 the COVID epidemic has really pushed us to be socially isolated. Now we're, we're coming out of it. And what I like to try to do is to, Ask how many, in my uh, assessments, ask them not when their meal time, not only when their meal times are, but how much time do they spend watching t television? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you know what you could do while you're watching television. So you must be pretty active because you can mm -hmm. actually do uh, <laughs> chair yoga while you're watching television. So again, trying to shift their paradigms uh, uh, and, and thinking about um, moving out of the, the sitting is the new smoking. Uh, okay, problem. Sandy, I'll get you on the next one. But uh, yeah, so it's like uh, Michael Greger, if you know how not to die, if you ever talk to him, he's always on a treadmill when he's on a Zoom call. So I started doing that. You bounce up and down a bit, but you know, so be it. And I have to add that, um, you know, as far as exercise, I'll never forget uh, at Rachel's request, Atchison, I was at the, with the Brooklyn Borough President years ago, he gave a talk, and someone in the audience asked uh, Eric Adams afterwards, uh, can, you, can you build a gym for us? And his response was, what do you mean, we already have one. Hmm. Really? He says, yeah, it's called a staircase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can go up and down. So you can take breaks and go up and down on the stairs. All right, sleep disorders, this uh, we spoke about. 
And uh, you really need to ask about this. It's, it's not discussed usually in the context of diabetes, but it, it's a real issue. And a lot of people have sleep disorders. The evidence for this is robust as far as how better sleep patterns can improve your glycemic control, your diabetes uh, management, and uh, um, it, it doesn't take a lot to do. You know, we always have value judgments we outline, and you know, it's very easy to miss this because people don't talk about it. But we're going to talk about it. <laughs> so, Sandy, sleep. As the closest to residency training and being forced to have terrible sleep, I think one of the most important things is maximizing the sleep that you are getting to make it effective too. So just like Dr. Frades was saying, those closeout curtains, the getting an eye mask, making sure things are quiet so that you can get the most effective sleep when you're forced to get less than what would be ideal. Great. Michelle. Yes, yeah, so I think one of, the, um, one of the things I love to talk about with patients is uh, their liquid consumption before bedtime. It's amazing how many people don't realize that they're drinking, I mean, I love people being hydrated, but get hydrated earlier in the day and then try to cut yourself off a couple hours before you go to bed and then people come back the next visit and they're like, I'm actually sleeping through the night, thank you. Um, so that's one. The other one I love to recommend is to take a morning walk. I'm a huge fan of morning walks for multiple reasons. Number one, you're walking, um, you're moving your body. Number two, you're actually helping restore your circadian rhythm because you're exposing your cells to sunlight, to your, your retina to sunlight, and that helps you sleep better. Hmm. John. I'll just add, our computers on our phones, they're fused literally to our faces most of the day. <laughs> it's true. And so, uh, Dr. Frady's eliminating it two hours before, it's, it's difficult to do, but it, it's something that we have to continually uh, encourage. Mm. Uh, Michelle's comment reminds me of, uh, what's the name, Robin Sharma, The 5 AM Club. Anybody read that book? It's, uh, it's all about how the most successful people get up and are active at 5 AM. And part of it is sunlight and light and seeing things. So no, people don't do that. I do it all. Well, no, I slept late today. I got up at 3.15 this morning and did nine miles on the treadmill of intervals before coming here. So uh, 5 a.m. is late. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on, it's late. And by the way, you can't average out your sleep. You can't, like, catch up on the weekends. It doesn't work. It, it's kind of like putting your left hand on the burning stovetop your right hand on a block of ice and saying, gee, on average, I feel pretty good. It doesn't work. You got to get the, the, the sleep regularly. You don't want the so-called shift work disorder where you're getting weird sleep. Nutrition. We've spoken about that a bit. And we have two statements on nutrition in our guideline, at least for now. One is about prevention. So this is for people with prediabetes, gestational diabetes mellitus, you really want to avoid this progressing to full-blown type 2 diabetes. And this is an old concept, again, going back to the diabetes prevention uh, programs. Uh, you can do this, and it's the best time to intervene. So we're very strong on, on prevention. And there's a number of things we can talk about here. I, I think I'll start with uh, Sandy, because I know she has a lot of nutrition interests. So in the context of prevention, your thoughts. So, so, so important. Personally, for me, I think this is the biggest thing that will get people feeling their best the fastest, too. Um, in the essence of time, one of the things I would definitely recommend is, one, give up soda give up those liquid sugary beverages that add the unnecessary calories and a lot of sugar into people's diets. Great advice, uh, Dr. McBacken. I think when I, when I have a patient with prediabetes, I think the first thing I wanna help them understand is that they have an amazing opportunity in front of them. Many mm. people think this runs in my family, it's just a matter of time. And so just setting that validation that what they, um, the, the foods that they choose to eat um, can make a huge difference. Um, and I didn't mention before, but we also, you obviously, uh, this is a wonderful time to assess someone's access to healthy foods um, and, and help them um, uh, receive resources for that. 
And you just to build on this, at your program in health and hospitals, I know I was at the Kings County launch. You have a, a massive kitchen and a chef, and you're yeah. really doing all the good stuff there, right? I think <laughs> your chef is County. back there. I saw him. Uh, very important. And you also triggered in my mind this concept of empowerment. I think a big point of lifestyle medicine in general and the interventions is that you are empowering the patient mm -hmm. to heal themselves and to take care of themselves, often without drugs. Medica it's one of the most, I think, enlightening and you know, wonderful messages you can give people. Jonathan. I'll springboard off of that it's into one of the questions I like to ask my patients is that are, are you the kind of person who likes to wait to be changed or <laughs> to change? And directly to Dr. Frady's, one of her main points in the story of her father, uh, do you know, I'll ask them, that you have the ability to change how you are going to age, how you are going to spend probably the rest of your life. You have that choice. And so putting them right back with that initial question, then they got, they're going to want to know why. How? How, how? how does that work and why does that work? Hopefully, they'll take that challenge. Wow, pique their interest, okay. <laughs> the second part of nutrition is nutrition for actual individuals who have type two diabetes. And we, we recommend here that the clinician or healthcare provider, you know, figure out, is their patient interested in full remission? or more just management, you know, de-escalating their meds, improving things, because it requires a little different uh, approach to do it. Uh, we can only find 31 systematic reviews that dealt with this, so there was a paucity of evidence. Uh, but it's, uh, and the evidence on, on this is really incredible, as uh, we mentioned before, it has to do with intensity. So. Uh, especially for remission. You can't just casually add a cup of beans to your weekly diet and think you're going to put your diabetes in remission. It takes a little more than that. And it is the optimal goal. So thinking about uh, nutrition, we'll, we'll go back to Jonathan again. I've been saving. We've got to get him up front. Come on. Jonathan, your well, thoughts I, on I, the I, remission. I, I have these pearls that I have collected over the years, and I read a, a, a book by Roger Landry, the uh, live long or, and die short. <laughs> um, the, uh, the whole idea about compression of morbidity, that we can compress our morbidity to the end of, of our lives, really, with a lot of these healthy lifestyle choices. So I try to help them with this 70-50 rule, mm -hmm. that he's, all the evidence in his book that basically says that 70% of our physical aging, 50% of our cognitive aging can be related to our lifestyle choices. So I try to drive that again back to the, to the patient. You have an incredible power in, in your choices. Okay, Sandy. Going off of Jonathan's numbers, I'm very practical and I like to kind of give my patients and help them find their goals and also help them achieve something that's actually a lifestyle, not just a diet. And so I have an 80-20 rule where 80% of the time you're good. You try to focus on whole foods, eating plant-based, avoiding processed foods, and 20% of the time is a cheat where you can eat that cookie, you can have that chocolate and kind of give in to what you want and what makes you happy so that you also feel like this is something that you can sustain long-term. Michelle? I want to talk about a four-letter word, which is carb. <laughs> um, carb. <laughs> we've alluded Oof. to this already, but I really, f I, I, I have found that when I'm um, talking with my patients who are living with uh, diabetes, you, it has to be discussed. You have to talk about it. You have to break down because they are getting messages from every single direction: their family, their friends, their other medical providers. Um, everyone is talking about don't eat carbs. And so it really, you really have to break this down and help people understand, um, especially if you're recommending eating more plant-based. So I, I do that, I have, I'm gonna go way over 60 seconds if I talk about it, so I'll just save it for questions um, later. 
And I think it's really important. So how many folks in the audience who have encountered either a family member, a patient, somebody with, with diabetes have encountered the carb phobia? Have you, you, mm -hmm. you yeah, I mean, it's yep. ubiquitous. And how many of you have been successful in telling the person with carb phobia, it's okay to eat whole grains? A few, very, maybe 10% of the hands. Yeah, it's a tough sell, I don't know, but we're hoping with our guideline, we're gonna focus a, a lot on that and give a lot of information to the patients. It's the quality, it's not, not carbs themselves. It's that fiber for all those uh, um, uh, short chain fatty acids and stuff your, your microbiome is churning out. Let's move to social connections and peer support. So the, we're asking people that um, you should emphasize and really advocate and counsel them about the importance of these positive social connections. And there's a few varieties of it. It could be through your peers, through your family members, through other professionals, support groups, and so on. And as usual, a lot of evidence uh, supporting this. We're, we're big on SMART goals throughout the, the guideline and have a lot of examples of those. So, in this context of peer support and social, and uh, Jonathan alluded to, to COVID, which I think has you know, added to a bit of a loneliness epidemic uh, out there. Uh, we'll start with Dr. McMackin. Uh, how do you view this? I think it's um, many patients when I ask them about, you know, what, who is your, who's meaningful to you in your life? Who provides you social support? And those folks in the room who are medical providers in our programs know that's part of our template for our initial visit and our follow-up visits. And that's a moment where um, often people will, it will become very emotional because either they'll have someone that they really, really care about and then you'll hear about it and you're very moved as well and you wanna talk about how can you strengthen and make sure that those bonds stay strong. And then it also can be emotional when someone tells you that they don't really have anyone and they want to have more social connection. Um, and so, you know, there's different um, approaches to that. Um, one of the things that I've actually really enjoyed doing is talking, especially for some of my older adults, uh, patients, talking about um, volunteer work. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to do volunteer work. Some of it can even be virtual if someone doesn't want to, you know, can't or doesn't want to leave their home. Um, so that's a wonderful thing that I have found to work with patients with. And it helps with finding purpose and meaning, which is, I kind of bring into this category too. Hmm. Sa Sandy, are you officially a Gen Z or a millennial? I think I'm still a millennial. A millennial, okay. So give us <laughs> the millennial perspective on this. <laughs> I actually love using the support system to help motivate patients to do things like exercising, eating healthy within their group. And I am a big fan of social media, Instagram, Facebook, to help find that community too. I think a lot of times social media can definitely have negative effects on people, but it can also have a lot of positive ones. So mm -hmm. for example, I'm a first time mom and the first Facebook group that I joined was Physician Moms and I found so much support in terms of what I'm trying to get through in finding other people who share that. So using that support system to say, hey, join a group Zumba class or join a cooking class so that you're not just doing one thing, but you're also finding a community who loves to do the same things that you do too. What happens at Yale? I have to say, <laughs> it's incredible because I was stunned. I was actually privileged to be one of the writers of this part of the guidelines. And my, one of my co-authors is here. Um, and I was stunned by how much I didn't know, how much I've never been trained about how much evidence is out there on positive social connection and the, and the effects. So uh, I'll just lay that groundwork, number one. And then to kind of uh, springboard, if you have any sense of the, the, the counterbalance of this is social isolation, loneliness, if you pick up on any of that, there, the, one of the teasers in these guidelines is an initial three question uh, assessment. You can ask patients, how often do you lack companionship? How often do you feel left out? How often do you feel isolated, socially isolated? That, those three questions, taken from a larger 20-point 
item question from mm -hmm. UCLA loneliness scale is, is going to be in these guidelines. Wow, that's uh, uh, great points. And our, our guideline in general is going to give very practical ways to get baseline assessments of the pillars using validated tools, very short, quick thing. I mean, physical activity is basically two questions. You have well-developed measures like John was alluding to for, for all the things. So I think that's it's very important because it's one thing to tell you to do this, it's another thing to make it easy. So we're gonna hopefully make it easy. Psychological interventions. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there, and it's more prevalent in individuals with diabetes, not just diabetes distress, which is well known, but other anxiety disorders, uh, mood affective disorders, uh, which can be very easily overlooked. Um, we do have someone representing the uh, American Psychiatric Association on our guideline panel who's been very helpful uh, for this. and. You know, the value judgment here I think is interesting that, that, you know, this is really important but people don't think about it. You know, when you, when you deal with lifestyle interventions for diabetes, most guidelines and folks don't go much beyond nutrition and maybe a little bit about your exercise or activity and then it all, you know, sort of becomes a, uh, a, a little bit uh, random. So for this psychological intervention, all sorts of possibilities here. Let's uh, reverse the order. So, Jonathan, uh, I don't want to stress you out. No, nope. great anxiety. Uh, or, but, this uh, actually uh, is a start. perfect uh, segue from the last uh, uh, social connections piece, because I think that you can go even deeper into how a chronic illness, being diagnosed with a chronic illness, can make you feel isolated. A patient feels like they're the only one dealing with it. They're the only one that has to follow this diet. How to bring in family members uh, to support that and involve it with them with exercise, family exercises, peer, exercise, uh, peer friend groups, all of those things. But I think, again, it's the screening tools, I think, that are the most important to be able uh, to assess how the patient is managing their chronic illness, no matter what it is. I know we're talking about diabetes, but I ask them two questions. What's the hardest thing right now? And what do you fear the most? And when I get answers from those, they, that can change at any visit, from one thing to the next. So that's what I like to do. Very practical. And uh, Sandy. New York is very fast paced, very high stress, <laughs> and a lot of the people who I speak with are very ambitious and don't have any plans of slowing down. So the stress is always gonna be there, and that big question is what are you doing to manage that stress? Because none of that is ever gonna change. And a lot of times with patients, and even myself and my peers, one of the questions that I ask is, what are you doing to manage your stress? And people may realize that they're not actually doing anything to combat it. And that's what leads to things like burnout. So just asking what are you doing, what makes you happy and relaxes you, is definitely a great place to start. So I'm going to disagree with the New York being stressful thing. <laughs> um, I did a fellowship many years ago in Washington, D.C. And when I got there, someone told me the way you define Washington, D.C. Is the, um, is the stress of the North with the speed of the South, which is a really <laughs> bad combination. But uh, yeah, it was more stressful. You know, you're a New Yorker. You want your slice of pizza in about 30 seconds. You know, not like five minutes. Forget it, you're like stressed out by then. So, Michelle. <laughs> So one of my favorite things to do with patients, and by the way, those are great answers, um, and I love hearing about my patients' coping mechanisms for stress. They're sometimes really surprising and, and great. Um, but I actually like to walk my patient through a breathing exercise during the visit, which is something that they can kind of take home and practice. Um, and again, as with many things that I do, there's a selfish angle because I'm stressed during <laughs> like a busy clinic day. Um, and so I'll teach the patient. There's so many variations on different breathing techniques. My personal favorite is the four, seven, eight. Um, breath count. So it's you're breathing in slowly, inhaling for a count of four, 
holding your breath for seven, or some people may not be able to hold it that long, so you can modify, but holding your breath at the top and then breathing out through your mouth slowly for a count of eight. Even just talking about it kind of helps me feel more relaxed, and I love doing it with patients, and they enjoy it as well and can take it home and, and practice. Great. We're flying here, by the way, I want you to know. Um, I, I've completely stressed all three of them out, but they're doing great. <laughs> So if you can all do the breathing exercise for us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Um, the last pillar here is the risky substances. So it's about alcohol, tobacco, recreational drugs, which are increasingly becoming legal, um, and how they might affect your, your diabetes. And uh, one of the individuals on the panel uh, has type 2 diabetes, and I remember her earlier on expressing, well, this is really of great importance that folks with, with diabetes, they really want to know, can we drink a little bit? Is, is it okay to have a glass of wine? That this is a real relevant thing. So we, we don't have as ro much robust evidence on other things, but we have a fair amount. And uh, some concepts are shown here. I'll, uh, I'll put Sandy on the spot and have her start about something that uh, she sees here that you might want to talk about. So one of the things that I think is important is building that relationship with the patients where they feel comfortable sharing with you. So when I was earlier in my career, which again was just a few years, I remember just straight up asking, how much do you drink, do you smoke? And the answer that I get compared to me saying, I'm worried about your liver enzymes, like, tell, like we can work together, I'm not gonna say don't drink anything, how much do you drink is very different. It went from somebody saying that they take a shot a week to that same person a little bit later saying, actually it's more like a three shots a day. So building that connection where they feel comfortable and know that you're on their side and not just going to say, that's bad for you, don't do it, is definitely going to help patients feel more comfortable sharing. Okay. Dr. McMacken. Yeah, definitely agree with a non-judgmental approach and, of course, meeting people and, you know, people, when people, we all know that for people to make a lifestyle change, they have to feel like something positive is going to come out of it, um, that they're going in a way that's actually going to help them feel better. Um, but I was struck recently by, in addition to all the data that you shared, Dr. Frady, is about alcohol and diabetes, the other angle, of course, is to think about um, what we formerly called fatty liver, um, which is now has the name Massel Metabolic Associated Steatotic Liver Dysfunction, it's a mouthful. <laughs> Um, but when most people who are living with type 2 diabetes have some element of muscled. And so we know that when you actually consume alcohol in that setting, it can actually um, you know, combine with the effects of insulin resistance and your pre-existing um, uh, steatosis in the liver. And so it is really important to think about limiting alcohol and helping our patients move in the direction of reducing or avoiding. Thank you. We went through those. Very quickly, I must say. So, um, I'm going to give each of our superstars here a, a couple of moments, two minutes each, to give you their thoughts about how you might want to bring this stuff into your, your practice. Jonathan, why don't you go first? Well, I'll springboard off of the last pillar into um, what I didn't get in my training 28 years ago, and that was how to talk to patients using motivational interviewing, how to talk with patients using shared decision making and techniques like the ORS technique. If I'm saying things that you have not heard about, go out and learn about those things or demand that it gets put in your uh, educational curriculum. Those are the techniques that allowed me to begin to have these conversations all, within all pillars, truly. Um, so where the rubber meets the road, we can have all the evidence that we want and read it and believe it ourselves, but if we can't connect with the patient sitting in front of us, it's never going to reach them. Mm -hmm. And that's got to happen, it's got to be followed up, and it's got to be sustained. So I'll leave it with that. That's it's a terrific point because for those of you who do pursue lifestyle medicine or get involved, it's not just the six pillars. Really, the unstated pillar seven is behavior change. 
and you know, health behavior, assessing readiness to change, using um, models like the trans-theoretical model, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, all these ways, coaching and support models to get people to actually have sustained change. And we will get into that in the, the guideline. So uh, Sandy, your concluding thoughts? So fun fact, it can take people anywhere from 21 to 152 days to make a behavior change. So it's not easy, it's something that you have to keep working on. And just like Jonathan was saying, I like to use SMART goals to try to identify what is the most important thing to my patient. So especially elderly patients, I feel like a lot of times they're like, oh, you know, I've already been doing it this way, I have diabetes, I've accepted it, we're done. I'm not gonna change what I'm doing. But asking them what's important to them. Do they wanna be there longer for their grandkids? Do they wanna be able to be more mobile or have that functional independence even 10 years down the line? And identifying what that specific thing is that's important to them can really help motivate them to make that change because it's not, a sprint, it's a long run that they're in for. It's a marathon, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lifestyle change is a marathon. All right, Michelle. I think one of the things that I realized is that you know, early on, I was trying to do a lot of sort of telling the patient what I recommended, and, um, and it's, that often does not work. Um, and so I, I loved, I think Dr. Frades, you're someone who says this all the time, but the patient is the expert in their own life. And I say that to myself almost with every single patient that I see because if I'm sitting there dying to say, I want you to do this, I often just say, just stop and ask them, what do you think you can work on? And what are you ready to work on? What, what, what kind of comes to mind? Um, and it, it's really great because they'll often have really good ideas that I would never have thought of because they're the expert. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we have actually made up quite a bit of time. So um, I think we, we have time for just a couple of questions. So please come to the mic if you're going to do it. So you can all pat yourselves on the back for we just lightning round, yeah. folks. They're good. This is a good panel, I gotta tell you, these folks are good. All right, so yes, first question. Uh, hi, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Viswanathan. Uh, I'm uh, uh, chair of psychiatry at uh, Downstate, and thank you for organizing this uh, very important conference. Uh, Dr. Fratis, I'm also the president of the American Psychiatric Association. <laughs> uh, I just became president two days ago. Thank you. And guess what? The, yeah, every president gets to choose a theme, and the theme I have chosen for my uh, presidency is Lifestyle for Positive Mental and Physical Health. All right. <laughs> so I look forward to working with your organization and other organizations. Uh, I have a couple of questions which are kind of more uh, scientific. Uh, one is uh, on uh, timing of exercise, you know, like uh, I run in the morning before breakfast because I can fit it in like Dr. Rosenblum does. And I think you know, probably it helps uh, burn down the fat. Uh, but on the other hand, I have seen evidence that people, uh, there are two things. You know, one is if you run after eating, you know, obviously it keeps the blood sugar uh, low. And I have also seen literature that people who exercise in the evening, uh, these are correlational studies, uh, who exercise in the evening live longer than people who exercise in the morning. <laughs> so any comments? <laughs> Uh, I, I can answer that because I delve into this literature, oh, yeah. and basically, you can find a study to report any to support anything you just said. It, it's a crapshoot out there. I, I think the common theme is that exercising fasted is a bad idea if you're going to do anything significant. So you want to have some carbohydrates on board, simple carbohydrates. You can eat some dates or figs or something or uh, and you want to have, ideally, some essential amino acids, which get into the bloodstream very quickly. There are you know, things you can, can get, has a little caffeine in there. But as far as time of day, it's a myth that if you do it on an empty stomach, you're going to lose more weight, or if you do it in the evening, you're going to gain weight or have trouble sleeping. Um, so I think it's whenever you want, just don't do it fasted. If you're going to be doing it more than, say, 60 to 90 minutes, refuel a little bit with some carbohydrates. But uh, 
Beyond that, unless anyone else knows of any hardcore evidence, I'm not, not aware of it. The best time is when you're willing when to you do, it. do it. That's <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When it fits in your day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the second question has to do with the processed food. And uh, uh, Dr. Bassin, I, I used to think like what you did till uh, about a half an hour ago. Yeah. I thought that as long you know, as you're eating other healthy foods, you know, because the problem with the processed food is you know, the, whether the evidence is on the processed food or is it simply because that's a proxy for your not, eating, uh, not eating healthy food? Uh, so the question is whether you are uh, eating, you know, as long as you're getting your fiber and plant-based, you know, cruciferous vegetables and all, is it okay to go on to processed foods? Mm. But then the problem is, uh, uh, the one is the research which was showing uh, the mortality associated with processed food. Usually in research, they try to statistically adjust for you are not eating healthy foods. The other thing is, uh, as Dr. Rosenfeld mentioned, sodium is a number one killer, and uh, many uh, processed foods, you know, do are high in sodium and also high in sugar, and also you know advanced uh, glycation end products because they're also fried. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, we uh, we cannot totally be without any enjoyment. Mm -hmm. uh, but are there dangers associated? with going you know, beyond a little bit of a process food. Can you so comment on that? Sandy, you've, I think, done the most research on this. Go ahead. I actually did a lecture or a, a session for high school students where I showed them a 20-ounce can of soda and then had the physical amount of sugar that was in there by tablespoons in a box next to it. And the kids were all completely disgusted and said, I don't want that. I would never have it. And of course, half of them accepted my seltzer alternative, and most of them still wanted soda. So when you see the actual amount of sodium and sugar in something, you realize, like, I would never willingly want to go eat that. But when it's packaged in these frozen foods, you don't taste it as much. And it's more of it being there for a preservative. So trying to avoid it as much as possible is definitely great. And the more fiber that you have in your diet, you just don't have room or feel hungry to add those processed mm -hmm. foods. But ACLM has a great spectrum of your diet. And you start with the sad American diet. And then over here, we have fully whole food plant-based. And everybody is on that spectrum. And everyone can choose where on that spectrum they want to stop. So I think saying a hard and fast, only this much processed food isn't really the best for patients because they know their life and they have to kind of pick where on that spectrum do I want to be. Great. And, and you know, especially for young kids now, um, and it's worse uh, w with Hispanic and, and black children, they're, they're eating like 80% ultra processed foods, uh, and, you know, and the obesity is through the roof. We have fortunately saved our last and most important question for last right before lunch, so go ahead. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rotasha Atkins-Jones, and I'm a volunteer for Plant Power Metro New York. I really have to say this has been an awesome conference thus far, but I have a challenging question for each one of you panelists. Mm -hmm. This is an all-day conference, and we've been sitting too long. Mm -hmm. So how can we get all this incredible information to grow ourselves but spend less time sitting so we need to integrate more breaks and be able to move because we all are talking about how important movement is. So that is my question and I love what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Solius push-ups. Go ahead. Yeah. Solius, Solius push-ups. He just said it. But we're going you're gonna have a lot of opportunity to do some walk in between all those tables in the networking session. And uh, Getting your lunch is a break, but I've uh, I don't know any other any, any thoughts. I have 11, uh, plus steps since this on, began. Uh, Michelle, you have thoughts on me. ways to secretly get the exercise? Well, you in said while you have 11,000 steps since yes, this conference I was began. Yeah. Up and down back Perfect. There while you guys were <laughs> There's nothing else to say. That's teaching us. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It's a good question, and it's, we're, it's, we've it's tried to. We had the little break in there before, but if we had too many breaks, we'd have no conference. So, you're, anybody is free. I think, as Beth, uh, Dr. Frady suggested, you can stand up anytime you want. You can twist and turn. Just don't do it if you have osteoporosis. And uh, you know, uh, there are four hug your neighbor. Four gyms right there. The four four staircases right there. And yeah. most importantly, yeah. we're going to go eat some lunch.